Hello, 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 my friends. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 72. No, 772, not 7227. 772. Damn, I'm getting high in the numbers. That is 772 with I, your host, and your friend you wish you never knew. Agostino Zinger coming at you live and direct from an undisclosed location somewhere in the depths of London, which happens to be in the UK, which was formerly a part of the European Union, but now is struggling on our own. Hope you're doing well wherever this lovely podcast may find you. I hope, for goodness sake, I absolutely hope that you're doing swimmingly. Where have I been? Um, none of your business. <laughs> Where have I been? None of your business. Um, no, I've been away for a couple of days. Um, I decided to take the day, the days off, mostly because it was my birthday. Um, I never celebrate my birthday. I really don't. I think celebrating your birthday over the age of twenty five is legitimately R worded. Um, I have a theory, and I think you know, women in general, I think over enthusiastic, loving, and very present parents. I think. Um, Hispanic women, I think black women between the ages of like 19 and 20, 32. Um, I think of guys who try and cosplay like they're on Love Island and stuff. I think um, dudes who haven't grown up out of being in uni dorms. I think all those guys and above have ruined birthdays. They've ruined the sanctity of birthdays. Almost like, you know, the people that celebrate, you know, the people that do gender reveal parties. Gender reveal party people have ruined parenthood, have ruined child raising, have ruined the sanctity of going to a gender reveal. They've turned it corny. Now no one cares about your gender reveal. No one cares about your kids. No one cares if you're pregnant. I know I don't, right? I don't give a flip and flip if you happen to be a woman and wow, you got pregnant. What a flip and shock. Oh my God, I shouldn't give you flowers and a box of chocolates. Who bloody cares? But all of those people have ruined these things that were once special. I think birthdays are one of them, but I've always had this belief that birthdays should not be celebrated over the age of 25. I'm a big believer in things not having phases, not having an age limit, but some things do. And I think a hard and fast rule for every adult, for every person over the age of 25 is to rid yourself from celebrating your birthday. <clears throat> now, does that mean you shouldn't toast yourself a drink? On your birthday? Of course not. Does that mean you shouldn't go out to your favorite bakery and get yourself a cake and eat that bad boy? Of course not. Does that mean you shouldn't go to your favorite restaurant, Hawksmoor, and get yourself a steak and chips and eat that and down a couple of glasses and then go to the bathroom and do a couple of bumps to the flipping waitresses and waiters? No, of course not. But what you shouldn't be doing over the age of 25 is having one of those big dumb badges on your flipping, you know, um, what you call it, shirt. You shouldn't be, you know, announcing that it's your birthday to the restaurant when you walk in, right? These are the things that you should not be doing. You should be leaving everybody alone. You should be not doing those type of things. But if you want to celebrate just as, a, as an occasion, as a flipping, as a day to remember, fair enough. I kind of did that because I took some time away and did my own thing. None of it is really interesting. None of it I'm probably going to share anyway because, you know, it's stuff that I do in my own private time. But I'm just reflecting on it in general. I was like, you know what? Birthdays are kind of lame in it. Like by default, they only really work when you're under 25 because usually around that age, you're most likely still living at home. You're most likely still around all your friends, probably friends from primary school, secondary school. I'd imagine. I don't know why it's 25 is the age, but I think 25 is that magic number where people start to fall off. Maybe some people get, you know, depending on the area that you grew up in. I grew up in a rough area, so maybe some people get locked up, some people die. Some people pass away in tragic circumstances. Some people die by the, you know, live by the sword or live by the flipping, you know, by the borer, get killed by the borer. But in general, people kind of fall by the wayside after 25, full-time jobs, look after families. So it's hard to gather your friends. But under 25, it's flipping lit. Some of the best birthday parties I ever had in my life were under the age of 25. And I think they were extra good because at the time when I was coming up, that's when people started doing that annoying thing where they'd invite you to a really expensive restaurant. And you'd be like broke as hell, but that's your friend. So you want to go and like, you know, celebrate their birthday and, you know, be there and whatever it may be. But you're flipping thinking, wow, I can only afford flipping, you know, starters. I might be able to get a starter and a tap water. That's it. And I'm tapped out, literally tapped out, right? Pun intended. So um, that's when I felt that trend kind of started. People started to go to like fancy restaurants for their birthdays. Well, I did the opposite because I started to think that people were purposely doing this fancy restaurant thing as a way to get a free meal. I would do the opposite. And I was lucky enough to have parents who were 
really generous in that regard when it came to birthdays. Not not well, not be, not not because it's my birthday, but more so because they wanted me to kind of look good in front of my friends type of thing. But I also think it's a good practice as well. So I remember back then. My parents would give me like fifty pound or something and tell me, "Hey, take your friends out to Nando's. Put that behind the till." Now, don't get me wrong, fifty pounds now in Nando's takes you nowhere. Fifty pounds in Nando's might get you a meal for one, maybe depending on like how big backed you are, right? But you can't really bust down fifty pound in Nando's anymore. It's not that time. But back then you could, so you could put fifty pound behind a bar on a flipping card, whatever. Do 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 do. Get your friends to eat, and that was a thing. And obviously, I'd mix in some of my own money from like selling shoes or whatever I was doing, right? So I had a bit of money there. And what I'd do, right, I would legitimately invite all my friends I used to go to church with and I'd flip in, just take them out. It was my birthday, but I'd say, hey, come out to my birthday, meals on me, which then meant all your friends could come because there were some friends who probably didn't have money. Well, even like they were broke, they literally, literally didn't have a penny to their name. And here you are taking them out for dinner on your flipping birthday. How amazing of a fucking deal was that? You get to hang out with your friends and you get a free meal. And I think back then, you know, people, it was easy to maybe get a refillable drink, right? Slip it in, mix a Fanta with a Coke, you know, get that little muddy, that little lean, muddy, muddy thing. You know what I mean? If you know, you know, right? A little muddy, a little muddy soft drink. You know what I mean? You think it was lean. So that was, that was one of the only times I can remember having a good birthday and again that was because i was around people that i knew for 10 plus years i was you're a bit of a naive lack of responsibility time in your life they matter a lot because it's all like oh my friends are recognizing me people are giving me text messages and sending me rah, rah, rah. right but i think all that stuff becomes very lame very gay over the age of 25 if you're one of those people as well it, it, it's even worse when you're one of those people who goes on social media and almost announces it's your birthday as a way to kind of signal that, you know, it's like, hey, you should be wishing me happy birthday. I was saying, hear me, hear me a second. I find a correlation between people who announce it's their birthday unannounced, <laughs> right, in order to garner birthday wishes in the same category. They're, they're, they're linked as a people online who have noticed this to be a trend now. Don't hear me out. Hear me out here. I've noticed this trend where people will go overboard showing pictures of their car getting broken into. And it's never a Toyota Corolla. It's never a Honda Accord. It's never a Nissan Micra. It's always like a really nice car. Oh, man, someone stole something from my car. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you love it. And it's some fucking Porsche. It's some BMW. It's some Bentley. It's some Jaguar. And, of course, the next slide is them taking to a shop the, the same day to get it fixed. It's back on road. They're standing in front of it. So clearly, it's not you like saying, hey, citizens of wherever I live, be careful. There's thieves around. No, it's you signaling, oh, look at me. I have a nice car and I can afford to get it fixed on the day. Same thing when it comes to flipping and announcing your birthday. You're like, hey, give me birthday wishes, please. I'm an adult baby. Make me feel seen. Make me feel loved, please. I think it's pathetic. I think over the age of 25, you have so many things to worry about in your life. So many things you have to flip in you know, think about day to day, you shouldn't be worried about your birthday to that extent. Should you toast yourself like I do on most birthdays? I go to a local offie. Now I've got one in my area, which is flipping wild, right? I've got a local offie in my area where I found brown label magnums, magnum drinks, brown label magnum drinks, right? Brown label ones for $3.50 per bottle, which to me is a bargain because there's another shop around the corner where I live where they sell them for $4.50 and other shops are $5.50. So I can get technically free of those bottles, you know, in and around £10, which is absolutely crazy, right? Because, you know, those things get twisted. Um, they don't give me the allergy things I usually get when I drink beer and other types of liquors. Um, obviously, they're full of sugar, so they're not good for the belly, not good for flipping, not in your carnival flipping stomach, but we move. But regardless, um, I had a good one. I enjoyed it. I celebrated my whatever, my year still being around this flipping, you know, treasured flipping earth that we live in, spinning ball inside space, whatever it may be. Um, wherever, good, amazing, but I don't think it should go overboard. I think you should have some decorum. You should have some tact when you're over to 25 and just rein it in a bit. There's nothing more embarrassing than going to, you know, a restaurant somewhere and seeing somebody that clearly looks over 25 with a hat on, with a badge, with balloons and shit. Like, it's your, like who cares? Like, no one fucking cares. And, it's, and I also feel kind of upset for the people that get shamed not going to someone's birthday oh like somebody some girl put some tiktok together oh my god it was my birthday and none of my friends turned up yeah because they're busy because they've got stuff to do it's easy to double tap a post send you a quick message send you that flipping party hat you know emoji on instagram wherever it may be then it is to attend your flipping birthday at flipping hacking son we don't want to come we don't care about you that much
No one should, actually, outside of your family and your close friends. But people don't want that. That's the thing. Though. That's the thing. People actually don't want to celebrate their birthdays with a close friend. They just want to appear popular. They want to appear loved. But if you care about your birthday party, really, you wouldn't really, you wouldn't really care who comes outside of your core two to three, five, ten people. That'll be the ones you care about. But no, people want people want their Instagram followers to reflect their fucking real life birthday. As if I've got like, on God, I've got like what? Nearly 3,000 followers on Instagram. I barely use that shit. But let's say that's my, you know, that's my social capital. Cool. Safe. Of the 3,000, how many of those people would I even call to have a conversation with? Let alone invite and say, hey, do you want to come to my birthday? Absolutely zero. That's what I'll tell you. Zero. Because I don't care. Genuinely don't care. One of the main reasons why I flipping stop posting on Instagram and stop engaging with it because it almost forced you to like know things about people that you don't want to know. Like I'd rather just meet you in real life and you tell me your update. Oh shit, my kid did this. That girl I was with broke up with me. I've moved to this job. I'm in this country. Then I'm being like forced to know about your life. Like I don't care that you went to fucking Swindon. Don't give a fuck that you're in Prague. Like I don't. I do not care. Really don't. And I think birthdays are another example of people just forcing what they care about in your face. It's my birthday. Another year on this earth. It's my birthday. It's like, shut up. Shut up. If you have a national insurance number, you shouldn't be celebrating your birthday. That's the hard and fast rule. If you pay, if you pay your flipping telephone bill by a monthly direct debit, you shouldn't be celebrating your flipping birthday. That's simply it. If you have, a, if you have hard sole shoes in your wardrobe that you have to wear sometimes three times a week, you shouldn't be celebrating your fifth birthday. Simple as that. Simple as that. Simple as that. I don't want to hear it from you. If you have a Tesco club card, if you have one of those Tesco club cards on your key ring or the mobile app, you shouldn't be celebrating your flipping birthday. Simple as that. I don't care what you say. It doesn't make any sense. People over 25 to celebrate their birthday are lame, um, uneducated, low-digit IQ people who probably deserve to be chucked into the nearest volcano. That's my stance, and I'm not going to budge for it. I'm not going to budge from it okay cool safe talking about days and years and when you meant to you know chill on stuff i was browsing one of my favorite instagram accounts of all time the one and only the shade borough and i saw this amazing post that legitimately legitimately made me want to laugh but i also thought to myself hold on what's the age limit for fucking carnival is there an age limit i think there should be an age limit right because this is the headline Man jailed for five years for carrying a gun at Notting Hill Carnival. A man has been jailed after police found a loaded Glock pistol he had stashed in a bum bag as he attended Carnival. Jade, J by the way, look at Jade. I don't know if you can see this on the picture, if you're not watching. He's wearing like a hockey mask, I think. Is that? Oh, shit. No, he's not. My bad. He's just really dark. God damn it. I apologize. I thought he had a hockey mask on. I thought he had one of those Playboy Carty hockey goalie mask on, but he's just really, really dark. Fair enough. We zoom back out. Anyway, let's keep on reading the article. Jane Charles, 35, had been carrying a weapon. It's funny I say that, isn't it? I'm saying he's really dark as if I look at Chris Brown. That's that fucking dark skin on dark skin violence. There's something about it. There's nothing. There's nobody's more racist than people that look like you, right? It's such a weird thing, isn't it? You know, if you know oh, white people say, no, 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 no. The person that's the most racist is somebody that fucking looks like you. Because they all suddenly think that they look like fucking Chloe Bailey, whereas you both the same shade. It's like, what? Anyway, we'll continue. J. Charles 35 had been carried... By the way, anyone called J. Charles, you probably should keep your wallet in your pocket, right? J. Charles. A boy that looks like that called J. Charles. Yeah, he's on He's on demon time. This guy's a bad you. J. Charles. That's a bad you, bro. Uh, uh, that's the kind of guy that probably didn't finish primary school. And like, on, on the real. Like, this guy's been fighting from the day he came out of the womb. Um, had been carrying a weapon on children. <laughs> J. Charles, 35, had been carrying a weapon on Children's Day. Bro, is there is there not a bigger oxymoron? He's got a name that looks like somebody that got chucked out of primary school. He's 35, and he was carrying a Glock pistol in a bum bag on Children's Day at Nine Hill Carnival. Could there not be a more oxymoronic fucking sentence in your entire life that you've ever seen? Charles from Queen's Park pleaded guilty on possession of a firearm and ammunition and was sentenced to five years at the court on Friday. To be fair, possession of a Glock pistol and only getting five years ain't too bad. Because I think New York has like, isn't New York like a 10-year thing? Isn't New York uh, sentences? Like, what's the sentence for New York? Um, uh, gun possession sentence 
New York. Isn't it really high in New York as well? The number. Let's see what they're saying here. Uh, criminal possession of fire. Okay, same. Penalties create um, up to four years in prison for a Class C felony. Third degree criminal possession charges carry up to seven years with a two year presumptive, uh, presumptive minimum. So between four to seven. So kind of the same. But I don't know. There's something because of how illegal guns are in the UK in general. I think five years ain't that bad, you know. I'm not gonna lie. That could have been worse. Maybe I'm maybe I'm you know minimizing what's happened there, but five years ain't too shabby. Um eagle-eyed fans have noticed that Charles attended not on your cover 2019 with Fredo and suspected to be an associate of the rapper. So here he is in 2019 with Fredo, standing next to a guy who's got the face of a 40-year-old, but the body of a 12-year-old. All these guys are dangerous. Guys that look like this, guys who look like this, who are, you know, 35 called J. Charles you know, going to carnival, like, because there's something, it has to be said as well. What age should you stop going to carnival? Should a 35-year-old be at not your carnival? I say no, because who are you daggering, really? Because that's what most mandem go carnival for. I'm one of the mandem, unfortunately so. I'm one of the mandem, right? And when I go to carnival, when I did go to carnival, one of the main reasons to go to carnival is to stunt, right? you got some new gums, you got some new crepes, Right, you want to show off, you want to buy a zoo, you want to drink a couple of liquid drinks, meet up the man dev, eh, 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 from afar, right? And you want to grind up, innit? You want to wind up on some bay, you want some big badum badum to be like caressing your junk, and you want to try your best to make sure you don't get a boner. It's really hard, but you want to try your best to just focus on the rhythm, focus on the dance, focus on that thing you saw on YouTube, right? And just like dance, 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 but you don't want to ever get a boner, you don't want to scare the hose away. Cool, not hoes, women. We get it, cool. Regardless, what age do you have to stop going carnival? At what age is, is it like almost on the verge of like diddling that you go carnival? I think 35 is probably over the limit because unfortunately so, the girls who are willing to have strangers grind up on their batties, for the most part, again, I'm not telling you for personal spirits. The girls who are most willing to have a strange man grind his private areas into their nyash, right? With the risk of them getting a boner and them feeling it and that's being weird, right? And maybe some pre ejaculate coming out there and them touching it, be like, ah, right? The only person that would do that is a young girl. Uh, probably a girl over 30, probably not going to let you do that. Not going to let you just come up to behind it and just start gripping her up. Not going to happen. So you are going to carnival at 35, knowing you're going to be grinding up on like what? Under 20s? Under 21s, yikes. I don't know about that, bro. I don't know about that. And also, it comes a point in time where things are just, it's done. I'm kind of lucky because, you know, I kind of always go into carnival on my own or sometimes I go carnival with my quote-unquote scene friends. Um, I hadn't really been, yeah, I went to carnival one time with, one, with some guys from ENDS. That ended in disaster, never again. But I've never really gone carnival with people, like with a group of, with a group of boys, let's say. I've always kind of just met people there, bumped into them, right? It was always me, may, maybe with like one person, two people, or by myself for the most part. But I haven't been to carnival in years, and I don't see the need for it. Because in my mind, the main reason why I'm going is the food, the music, and to bust a wine. And if I can't bust a wine, it kind of takes a it takes a joy out of going to carnival. And I'm not gonna go bust a wine on some 21 year old, on some 90. Like, just not. That's not my vibe in the slightest. So I'd rather not. And I also don't want to be plastered, uh, uh, you know, on some social media page with my fucking, you know, best chance to rapper face. Like, allow that. That's not really what I'm on. So I think in general, this guy probably could have avoided all of these issues if he didn't carry his Glock in the first place. And don't go to carnival with a strap. Going to carnival with a strap is like insane. Really, really, really insane. But I bet you any money, if you saw him at carnival, you would have felt he had a strap on him. Because there's something about guys in London, when they're carrying a blicky, you can feel it. You can feel it. Like the chest is like extra bold. Guy will stare you down all the way to the end of the street. Just mean mugging you. Just, just, ugh. You know he's got something. You know he's got a tool. You know it. You know it. Because that, 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 that fucking Glock gives them guys just this, like, it's almost like um, the opposite of kryptonite, you know? It gives them this flipping power. It gives them this flipping authority to just, like, someone try me so I can blow your head off. It's like, bro, relax, bro. I just want to get some rice and peas. I want to lick down this jerk. 
I might want to bust down on this flipping six foot three, you know, St. Lucian girl. That's what I want to do. You know what I mean? I'm like, leave me alone. I want to climb this girl like a fucking jungle gym. You know what I mean? I want to do a hand sign on her back and shit. But that's it. I don't want no trouble, bro. I don't want any smoke. This Ray nephew's already kicking my ass, right? I saw one guy actually on flipping social, some psycho guy mixing Ray nephews with Magnum, pouring Ray and nephews into Magnum. Bro, that's a flipping, that's a new killer weapon. I swear to God. So imagine you're already licked. You might be a bit high. You might be a bit zooted up. You might have a bit of molly in your system, right? And then here comes this guy with his Gucci flipping, you know, with his Gucci little bum bag with a blicky inside, just staring you down. Urgh. You're thinking, raw, why not upset Jade? Why one for Jade? Why is Jade staring me down? Well, Jade's staring you down because he's got the tool in his flipping bag. He's got the tool in his bag and he's waiting for you to say something so he can blow your head off. So I'm thankful. I, for one, am thankful that I'm going out on the carnival anymore because this is how people are there. No people went to enjoy themselves, have a good time. These type of people. And the funny thing is, well, about carnival, just to end it, I'm surprised. I'm not going to lie. I'm surprised it still goes on. Because it's one of the only days in London we have where you can kind of, you know, do what happens at carnival, like listen to loud music, congregate in big groups, especially black people, smoke, drink, and not get arrested. And for the most part, there's always trouble every year. Every year people gather at Notting Hill Carnival. There's always, now again, it, 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 you know, it, it varies in the levels of severity. I know some pro-black people are going to be like, yeah, but there's trouble also at all the white festivals. Okay, we get it. But I'm just, we know how London is. We know how they move. When people die, when people get stabbed, when people get rushed, you know, police come cramping down, local council start crying. When somebody think of the fucking gentrification, gentrifiers and shit, everyone gets in the tizzy. So I'm legit surprised that Carnival still exists. I'm not going to lie. I'm legit surprised that Carnival is still a thing despite all the trouble that happens there. I swear to God. I swear to flipping God. But regardless, um, free Jay Charles. Don't let like see anybody in pen. Hopefully he bust case. But five years ain't too shabby. You got to stand in floppy not your Carnival with a strap on. You're going to be a hood legend when you come out anyway. Fred is going to hold you down. It is what it is. It is what it is. It is what it blood clot is moving on from that one <laughs> moving on from that one and continuing on with some other posts i want to feature here regarding the good old things that happen on your social media right let me get up for you one moment please if you don't mind this post big up the shade bar once again it features the one and only marks from mash town right Marks has been on a bit of a mad one anyway. I saw a clip of Marks essentially calling himself like the UK Drake or something. I don't know. He was on a mad one. Ah, oh, people know about me. I set pace. Ah, ah, ah. Like, I don't know. He was he was on a mad. Don't get me wrong. Marks back in the day had his time. He was one of the, you know, he was a cold MC. Um, I think, but similar to like Scorcher, he just never really fulfilled his potential. So I don't think he should be on any pods really bragging about what he set forward and the blueprint that he laid down, blah, 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 because people have taken what he'd done and those older, olders and, and ran with it and become multimillionaires off of their music. Whereas he's made most of his money from talking. And I think it's a real shame because he's obviously a talented MC, obviously a talented musician and artist, and he should be making a sizable amount of money through his art, through his talent. But instead, Instead, he's making more money talking about oh so who should pay on the first day like so come on bro that's that's an l regardless i love the confidence and the br the bravado and the brazenness of guys in the uk when it comes to talking to girls so there's this clip that features thames and this person called Dusin right vibing to a song called love me jeji and obviously thames is in the front of the camera looking delightful right just doing what she does right hot girl shit and <laughs> Marks quotes this and says, if I've met Thames, I'm going to slam it on her. Watch. Some shots you have to shoot. And it's like, bro, I don't think Thames has had anybody in her vicinity ever use the words slam it on her and get anywhere close to touching her, let alone breathe in the same airspace as she breathes. So to suggest that that kind of language, <laughs> that kind of presentation would get you anywhere is insane. But these same guys are the ones where if Thames turns him down in a brutal way, 
he will start calling her ugly. He will start saying she's got an attitude. So what? You don't want to get drawn. Why one for girls these days? You coming out? He's like you don't want to talk to the man. Them. It's like no, no, no. She wants to talk. She wants to get hollered at, but not by you, and not in that way. That's fucking wild. To to kind of because the thing. Even other thing about it is, well, he's like a prominent person in the UK at least. But you know it's going to get on places. So you're kind of doing this in the hopes that she might see it because a blog might pick it up and shit. So you'd think you want to put your best foot forward. You might want to say, oh, wow, if I ever met Thames, I don't know what I'd say. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not going to lie. I might be lost for words. Like, or whatever, just gas it up a little bit. Put some paprika on your rice, bruh. You know what I mean? Come on, man. Season the thing. Soften it. I don't know, like, smooth the edges out a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, give it the little IKEA you know what I mean? The little edges, smoothing them out a little bit, a little bit of sandpaper, a little bit of polishing. Don't just come in there mad raw like I'll slam it on her as if she's some fucking scallywag from, I don't know, some Homerton fucking estate. Like, come on, man. Give her the grace to at least be <laughs> somewhat gentleman-like on the internet. But this is what I love about us. This is the confidence and this is the bravado that we have. Like, people talk to this, people... Guys like this talk to girls like this in every situation. Like, Miles could go to Chilton Firehouse and be surrounded by all these, like, white Chelsea baddies and be talking to them this way. Hey, yo, that's what he's saying. What are you saying? It's like, let's relax the tempo. Let's maybe soften our voices up a little bit and let's get in that way. You know what I mean? It's not that, it's not that much to do. But on another way, I much prefer this than, you know, some of these American guys out here who are just, I don't know, this fly-out culture thing. This whole shopping spree thing, just to get someone to like give you time of day, is just wild. So if we, if I had to choose between, you know, this rough, tough language with the with the galdems, with the ladies, with the women, with the madams, with the mujeres, right, with the fraus, I take this over like the guys promoting. Oh, you should take a girl out and go to flipping Nobu and spend all this money and you know drive up in a flipping Lambo and this is like, look, dude. If the, if you need material if you need material things to get girls to give you attention, you've probably already lost, in my personal opinion. But again, what do I know? What do I know? Absolutely nothing. That's what I know. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely zero. And I'm glad that I know absolutely zero. I really, really, really do. Next and last on the list. Next and last on the list. <laughs> I don't know about you, right? But I'm wondering, in life, I wonder what it must feel like for, like, gays and lesbians out there. With all this queer baiting going on, with all this gay baiting going on, and with people going through phases. Why do I say that? Because Shea Burrow's got this post that features the one and only delightful singer, magnificent voice, Jessie J, and her partner and father of a child, a person called Channon Coleman, who's a basketballer. For some reason, they decided to upload this video of them dancing, um, you know, on the sh whatever, onto her Instagram profile. She's clearly liking it. He's liking it, gripping the bat. She's rubbing his back and shit. When I heard, when I was saw the video, I thought they were dancing to like I don't know, um, uh, Dembo, Kizomba, I don't know, whatever, something that would require you to be this close. But when you actually play the music, I swear it's some drill record. Fucking wild. So the 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 dancing doesn't match the actual whatever's going on there, right? So. That's the first thing you have to flip in, you know, keep in mind. The dancing does not match what it actually is actually occurring <laughs> on the screen itself. But that aside, the other thing that kind of crossed my mind wasn't Jesse J a lesbian. So I think to myself, like, imagine if you're a lesbian, right? Imagine if you're like, you've always known this. You're, you're a gold star, as they say. You get into a relationship with fucking Jesse J. And in the back of your head, you're like, this might be a waste of time because you know this person's going through a phase. But you can't say it because it's not a politically correct thing to say. But then she does go through a phase and now you're left picking up the pieces after this person spent whatever time they spent with you while they go off and choose a completely different direction for their lives. So it must be, I'd imagine, it must be a pretty annoying thing if you're in that community to have people like just dibble and dabble because it's because, you know, people, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm bi. No, you're not really bi, are you? You're really going through a phase or you're just drunk. You're just drunk and horny, so here you are wanting to make out with a girl, or you're legitimately going through a phase and you're not really too sure, which is okay, but also don't fake the funk and don't give people false hope. You know what I mean? Having a girlfriend, all this, it's like, God damn, bro. 
So now you're going to lead this person, go to a, don't go a complete dire- different direction and then be annoyed when that community stands up and starts calling you names and shit. That's the first thing that came to mind. I was thinking, hold on, I swear Jessie J was lesbian. I swear she came out and said, yeah, I'm lesbian. And she had a whole girlfriend at one time. Was dead. Like, I was like, well, I'll go on for this. Now all of a sudden you're like on this wave. Okay, cool. I guess you're happy because, you know, only happy people would post these type of videos. But I'd imagine the person that she was last with, the girl must be kind of mad. And she has every right to be kind of mad. And I think this is like a an ongoing thing. And I wonder if this thing is like um, representative of just where we are in society. People just lack identities. People just are a bit lost. So they probably try and find themselves, oddly enough, in their sexuality, in who they get with. In the like, It's a strange thing to kind of have it as part of your main identity. But that's what people are doing nowadays. And the unfortunate thing with that sort of stuff is that it always involves another person. It's one thing going through your own journey of self-discovery by yourself, but when it involves other people and you're kind of leaving all these broken people by the wayside and you're just carrying on like nothing's happening type of thing, I think it's a bit unfair. It's a bit, it's a bit selfish. Um, It's kind of destructive and just isn't cool. Isn't really nice, but Hey, um, they're happy. They're dancing, slow whining to fucking UK drill. So everybody's happy in that regard. I guess everybody will be happy in that regard. What do I know? What do I bloody know? Absolutely nothing, my friends. Absolutely nothing, my friends. All right. Moving on, moving on, moving on. So there's this video I want to play for you guys that features the one and only Abraham Preach. Abraham Preach did this amazing breakdown of the recent interview that Amanda Seals did with, um, what you call it, Shannon Sharp uh, on his podcast called Club Shay Shay. And it's an amazing breakdown because they kind of surmise the whole, you know, Amanda Seals interview in 40 minutes. But the reason why I want to play this for you is because I felt like this is a perfect, this is, um, this was for me a reminder as to why I'm so happy that I just got dealt with the, you know, gene, whatever, lottery cards in the right way, where I didn't end up being this type of person who was unable to see how they were perceived by other people and always made it seem as if it was everybody else's issue. They have an issue with them and it's nothing they have to work on. Because as the title says, Amanda Sills is an amazing professional victim and she thinks that everybody else has a problem with her and she's done nothing completely wrong. And I think that interview with Shannon Sharp has illustrated just how, just has illustrated why everybody seems to not like this woman. So let's hear from Abraham Preach as they break this down. But I think this is a fantastic video and really does a good way of kind of breaking the whole thing down. Let's go. Today's topic, Amanda Seals. Our full disclaimer, I don't like her. I just... You don't like her? I don't. You don't like her? I don't think there's ever been an interview where I watched her for more than five minutes and, and thought... she was likable. I think I would enjoy a conversation with this human being. But she did an interview with Shannon Sharp. It went viral for a lot of different reasons. You guys sent me this interview. A lot of you guys DM'd me. And I kind of hate you for it because I watched it... <laughs> I was about that. And then I edited it down so that you guys don't have to hate it as much as I will. Now it went from t- three hours to 22 minutes. And I promise you, you still going to hate her. I told you I was about to watch it. And you said, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was about to watch it. No, uh, don't do it. I, I don't think folks realize behind the scenes how much <laughs> I have to do sometimes because this shit was yeah, disgusting. You did. <laughs> well, hey, you're going to see why, okay? I'm going to. I'm going to just play some of these clips back to back. You know okay. what? I can't wait to see. Amanda Seals is an actress, podcaster, comedian, DJ, musician, poet. She's a lot of things, okay? And to be fair to her, her career resume is extensive. From a child actor to even up until today, she's done a lot in the entertainment industry. She was part of the TV show Insecure, where a lot of people know her. She was also part of Flowetry. She was part of one of her favorite daytime TV shows, The Real. If you guys are wondering what all these clips are, I'm just piecing together her conflicts with people. In a three-hour interview, there might have been at least 30 to 35 different people from all walks of life, different points of her life, before she was famous, after she was famous, school, (laughs) elementary school, middle school, (laughs) work, radio, didn't didn't matter. Everywhere she went, motherfuckers hated her. I present to you a professional victim, Amanda Seals. I am a genius. (laughs) Give her some time, bro. Let her cook. 
Let her cook, bro. <laughs> it's just but, but yo, you told me let her cook, but it's like whenever you try to cook and then you put people walk in the room and they're like, mm, he smells good. What are you cooking? It's just garlic and oil. Calm down. <laughs> it still smells fire. <laughs> okay, let's go though. Let's go. I am a genius. I'm a gifted performer. I am a gifted person. I am a creative genius. I'm generous. I am giving. <laughs> I am kind. <laughs> Bro, she 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 just she got some lovers. <laughs> she sounds like you know you you know when you're like in a job interview and you start talking about yourself too much, and you like oh shit you notice that like you're starting to give yourself too much praise. You just flow in you just throw in some self deprecating things here and there. She's not even on that time. She, all she sees when she looks in the mirror is perfection. You gotta love her. I fucking love Amanda Seals. <laughs> she confident. Hey, if, if nobody. He's gonna love you. Who will? I'm funny. I'm delightful. Like these are not things that um, I need to wait for somebody to say about me. I know these things about myself. It is my habit because I've always been labeled as this. You think you know everything. It's not that I think I know everything, but I really did know the answer. And I'm thinking <laughs> I'm helping the room out by ha having the answer. Oh. But they like. Ugh. Thank you, a know it all. You know what's funny about that? I've always done the opposite. Like, I've always been the person, I think it's really important. I think that's a kind of the skill in being a good friend. I think it's really important if you want to be a good friend. To be, and again, this is bad coming from me because I don't have no friends. But bear with me a second while I be a little bit hypocritical and just talk out my ass for a second. But it's a podcast. That's what you're meant to be doing. Cool. Safe. All right. Let's go. But I think in order to be a good friend, you have to know when to shut the fuck up and let the friend have the, have the floor. So sometimes you could be with your friend and they could be talking about something that they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. They're passionate about it. They're curious about it. They want to share this thing to you, share this thing with you. And you know they're talking out their ass. You know you know the answers. But sometimes it's nice just to let your friend go off. Because why the fuck not? It's a conversation amongst friends over beer. It's not some CNN interview. You're not having, it's not a fucking interview on the New York Times. You're having a conversation with your pal. Let them have the floor. Or better yet, when you, you know, you've got the type of friends who like, just wait for you to shut up and then they can say what they want to say, but not really listening. I think another skill, even if you're that kind of person, just to pretend to listen, just let them have the, let them have the floor. Let them have the floor until they're exhausted, until they are tired of hearing themselves, then you can talk. But this idea of like always wanting to correct people, always wanting to flip in, clarify, clarify things and just always have something to say and not give somebody space to talk or, let, or not let them land, as we say in Twitter Spaces world, it's so annoying. Let, it's annoying already in the workplace. I couldn't imagine how annoying it would be if that person was your friend. You know what I mean? You're a lot. You're a show off. You're extra. In my first, my sophomore year of college, I was put in a suite with seven other women. And the day I got there, my name had been ripped off the door and thrown on the ground. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even know these women. God damn, they hate you from the jump. <laughs> So, mind you, she's not even well-known right now. She's in college. Let's keep listening. And insane. two weeks in of them not talking to me, I said, listen, I'd like to have a Friday night where I buy a bottle of tequila and we all just sit around and y'all can take shots and tell me why you don't like me. And everybody's... And I love, I love how she recounts her stories as if she said it that calmly. I love how she's recounting it like she said it that calmly, like she didn't cuss anybody out. She just took it on the chin. Okay, these girls ripped my name off the thing. Oh, no, what can you do? Hey, ladies. Just a second. I know you all hate me, but could I just steal two seconds of your time and just get let you guys know you're all really beautiful women in all your ways, in all shapes and sizes, whatever you are, you're all beautiful to me. And I want to get to know you more. I want you to love me the way I love you. So I've organized some drink. Like, she didn't say it that way. You know what I mean? But she's recounting it like she's the perfect, perfect, perfect witness. It's like, come on, bro. You're not, the, you're not a believable narrator, man. We don't believe you, Amanda. You seem kind of easy to hate. Reason was, I don't like you because you think you all that. I don't like you because you extra. I don't like you because you a show off. None of that shit is anything having, like, I'm not harming them. Right. <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm literally just trying to But exist. they formed this opinion of you prior to meeting you. <laughs> like, I'm just trying to exist. I'm literally just, exi I'm literally just existing in the world. <laughs> and it's a fucking problem. And if you're going to not like me, I would at least like it to be for a legit reason. Yeah, Shannon, that's why her story don't make no sense. People don't just hate you for no reason. Exactly. Seven people in your fucking mm. dorm setup hated you from the first day they saw you 
It's not because you discard those reasons that they're not legit. Mm. Basically, they don't like you because you're annoying as fuck. As someone that is too much, someone that is uh, a know-it-all, someone that's that labeled by a lot of people, basically, it's because you're annoying. Exactly. I'm just trying to live. Yes, but you living is taking so much space that you don't allow other people to live. Mm. Yeah, but it's for them to take their space. See what I mean? Do not consider it. <laughs> there is the truth. There is my truth. And a lot of times, baby, it's the same. Mm -hmm. And one what? of the reasons why you can see that is because when, when I recount a story, I want you to notice this when I recount stories. <laughs> I, love, I love that thing. I think that's, that's a classic sign of a narcissist. You see it a lot in Brendan. Whenever he's watching a clip of himself on Instagram or whatever, he'll start laughing and smiling at the thought of himself. Like, just most people, most normal, well-adjusted people cringe at the sound of their own voice. Don't want to sit there with their friends, with their colleagues, and watch a clip of themselves do whatever. It's just embarrassing. We, we don't like it. He will sit there and legitimately smile at the thought of himself and actually maybe even mime along to things that he's saying. And you notice Amanda Seals there, she's, she's, she kind of thought of what she's about to say and then smiled at the thought of like, look how brilliant I am. Look how considerate I am. Look at the things. Notice what I say. And she's smiling at the thought of herself. Absolutely brilliant narcissistic trait. You fucking love it. How you can see that is because when you, when I recount a story, I want you to notice this when I recount stories. I don't. I very rarely include my feelings. <laughs> it's never. I felt that this person did this. I thought that this person did this. It's like reading Game of Thrones. He's it's gonna give you this. I don't want this to be an easy interview. I'm, it's like reading Game of Thrones. What? Like it's made up. <laughs> what kind of example is that? It's like reading Game of Thrones. Well, like a made-up story. Cool, bruv. Cool. I need to address whatever. Well, first of all, are, are you still on Insecure? What kind of dumbass question is that? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, let's go back again. That's an amazing exchange, right? Listen to this. Listen to, listen to what she says. Listen to what she says to uh, uh, DJ Envy. He's it's gonna actually give you happened. This, I don't want this to be an easy interview. Uh -huh. I'm ready to address whatever. Well, first of all, are, are you still on Insecure? What kind of dumbass question is that? I'm just <laughs> I want to address whatever. What, are you still insecure? What kind of dumb is like? She's so amazing. She's such a nightmare. Next question. Well, who a, was the person that did not like No, you? we're not doing that. But I feel like... <laughs> as Ask a, the questions. Don't take it easy on me. That's what you want. Amanda's the only factual person in the world. When she tells exactly. a story, her perspective is the perspective. Exactly. Let's that is part going. of my autism. I speak in direct... I speak in linear space. By the way, autism isn't... Her autism is self-diagnosed. That's another thing, too, that I detest with people online nowadays. Don't give me your mental health status unless it's been diagnosed by a clinical practitioner. I don't care. I don't care. Unless it's been diagnosed officially, it doesn't exist. You've made it up. I'm sorry. I got depression. Really? Have you seen anybody for it? Have you checked up on it? Really? Take any medication? Do anything for it? No? Okay, cool. I don't care. I got bipolar. Really? Can you spell bipolar, motherfucker? Okay, cool. Shut the fuck up. He says, I speak in literals. That's part of the reason why people don't like me neither. So when I was at Disney, yes. and I was in the situation at Disney, I was there as the only black girl. Okay. And there was a whole crew. It's like 12 of us, 12 of us. Um, and so I was called an N-word right there while I was there. <laughs> and... Uh, I was also bullied while I was there because I was told that you're only here because you're black. You can't really dance. You're just here because you're black. So don't get any ideas. I ended up getting kicked out of the conservatory. <laughs> so one of the guys in my class. I love this interview because in a way, it's a perfect mirror. Shannon Sharp is the consumer professional. He's made a career out of like doing the job, turning up, turning it on, being on time being a pleasure to work with, knowing what he has to talk about, you know, doing his research, like the consumer professional. He's learned how to navigate within the corporate world being a big black man. Cool. Amanda Seals is the opposite. She's trying to use her blackness, right, as a crowbar, as a, tr like, as a Trojan horse to mask all of her shitty personality traits. Like, you shouldn't have any issues with her. You shouldn't have any things to call her up upon because she happens to be black. Because she's a black woman, right? Two of the most rarest, you know, things in the world that should be put on a fucking pedestal somewhere and people should be crossed armed, gawking at it and like throwing flowers all over it. That gives her every right to be a cunt to people. It's like, bruh, you don't get to be, you know, un you don't get to be unlikable 
and then also complain when people don't like you. Like, that's just not how it works. Like, you're allowed to be unlikable if you want. Be unlikable. But having a bit of self-awareness about your unlikability is actually quite good as well. That can actually get you quite far. But she seems to legitimately think she's the hero of her own story when she's actually the villain. That's the worst part of it. She's the villain of her own story, but she thinks she's the hero. Pretty sad, considering how talented she is. That's a problem as well. She's actually dumbly talented, but can't get out of her own way. Nothing worse than that. Yes. Created a story. And he told the teacher a lie. He told her that I was listening to my headphones in class, um, which I was not. But she was already a baddie lady anyway. And again, I'm the only black girl in my class. So, like, you're just a very easy target. Um, she just lost it. I mean, she lost it. She was like, I can't believe this. So what? in one moment, being black makes you special. And also another moment, being black makes you the victim. Hey, 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 hey. Choose one. Being black, what? Is it a superpower or is it the ultimate curse? Which one is it? I can't believe you would be here listening to your headphones. I mean, had you had any run-ins with this teacher prior to this? So, so then she goes on a mission to get me kicked out of the conservatory. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there's no excuse. I don't know. I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. I don't know. But she definitely went... I love Shannon Sharp's face. He's like, bitch, don't you know? You know, man. You know why people don't like you. You know. Don't pretend like you don't know. And I love this interview, too, because as they've shown with these clips, she's been getting hated on from the moment she stepped into the, into the you know, she stepped into public. It's a public view. The moment she's around other people, the moment she steps out of her house, the moment she stepped off the porch, as people, as people say, right? The moment she hopped off the porch, people hated her. And for some reason, she couldn't figure out in all her years existing that it might be her. She might be the common denominator in all of these things. It just hasn't clicked yet. I love it. Went the distance and she got me kicked out. It had to have hurt to have these black publications. Speak I had a nervous breakdown. It's just the willingness of folks to sell their souls for so little. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I love her so much. I feel like that's what you have to do to like put your gift of being a writer mm -hmm. to work in such a nefarious way. Mm -hmm. I ain't met none of these people. <laughs> I ain't done none of these people. Shout out to college mm -hmm. um, when she went to a post academic uh, schooling. Her teacher hated her. One of her <laughs> other classmates decided to tell a random lie about her. All these things for no reason. Uh, black publications wrote bad things about her again unwarranted let's keep listening i like to think that they were paid by apac because if you sorry not for nothing they were paid by juice i think i've gotten in my own way by being more honest than i needed to be in certain situations this is not conceit or cockiness <laughs> this is somebody who has really sat here and looked at this i think some people don't like me because i'm very light-skinned i think some people don't like me because I'm a woman with a very strong point of view and an opinion <laughs> imagine saying people don't like you because you're light-skinned shouldn't it be the opposite shouldn't you have the complex that people love you because you're light-skinned shouldn't you think people maybe overrate you because you're light-skinned shouldn't that be how your brain should think or shouldn't you just never think that way anyway in the first place you know this woman's insane she reminds me of that meme you know when you go to job interview and they're like oh um what's the one thing about yourself that you need to improve on and in your head, you have to fight the urge to not say, oh, I work too hard. Sometimes I don't stop until the job is done. You have to fight the urge not to say that because you know it's so corny. You know it's so cliche. You know it's wrong. But every fiber of your body wants to say it. I'm just too hard working. You know what I mean? But you can't say that. You have to actually look for an actual reason, an actual legit one. And I think you should always have that in mind. Always have one thing in mind that's actually legit. Like for me, it would just be like time. My time management isn't the best. Um, I sometimes don't prioritize things I need to prioritize. I sometimes will take too much on. No, that, that's not good. See, that, that's, that's another kind of sucking your dick. When you say, oh, I just take too much. I just, I, I just can't say no. I want to help out the team. I take on all the projects. I'm always willing and able to do anything. Like that's a bit too much. You have to always have one legit fault of yourself. And if you don't actually have one, you're almost a broken human, to be honest, as well. If you legitimately can't see the error of your own ways or there aren't things about yourself that cr that make yourself cringe, like there's something a bit broken in your brain. We all have that in us. The ability to embarrass and to cringe and to kind of let ourselves down. 
you should probably store that in your brain. So when somebody asks you the question, the job interview, you have it to hand and you don't end up sounding like Amanda Seals. Some people don't like me because I may reflect something that they desire. Listen, the reason why people don't like me is because, you know, I'm wonderful. I'm amazing. <laughs> and people don't like me for that. <laughs> uh, people don't like me because uh, I'm a total bitch. Which stands for be babe in total control of herself. That's why they don't like me. I think some people don't like me for the reasons that they don't like themselves. What? And I know that there are reasons you don't like me that were handed down to you in some situations. Whoa! Patriarchy, I mean by racism, I mean by classism. <laughs> what? You know, you don't like me because I can talk proper or something. You know, like if that's a source of ire for you, like I'm I'm like mad. I I'm not I'm not too sure, but even that sentence, is that sentence proper? You don't like me because I can talk proper. Does that sound proper to you? I don't know. Somebody put it in you. I've been bullied for being smart. I don't know how being unabashedly smart has become such a villainous thing. I am fucking Scholar <laughs> and Molly. I'm a crusader. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm a Green Beret. Yo, she's in, the, she's in the 1,000 top comedians out there, bro. To be fair, you know what's funny, actually? When Joe Rogan, all those guys say there's only 1,000 or now it's 250 um, great comedians in the world, I love that they all happen to be English speaking and the majority of them are all men and who happen to be his friends. Isn't that funny? So I wonder if she's actually in that group because Rogan only thinks his friends are the best comedians, only the ones he's seen and only ones he can understand and only the ones that have cocks between their legs. Funny that. Funny, funny, funny that. Say it for difficult women. You didn't get a check for this and you just did this just to do it. I'm just like, damn. That... That's unfortunate for you. Look at Shannon. Look at Shannon. Look at Shannon. Look at that. Usually, right? Usually, in social settings, when you're talking to somebody and they have the face that Shannon Sharp currently has on the screen, where he's like looking almost stone faced, slumped on the couch, he's got the face of exasperation, tiredness, and just just lost. Usually, that's a sign that you're choking, that you're chatting shit. Most people are like, oh, shit, oh, I'm losing the person. You're losing them. They've got that glazed over look on their face. And usually you switch it up or you try and get them back engaged. Or you basically ask a question, hey, that's anything wrong? A normal person, that's what you, that's what you do. Amanda Seals is just going. She's just going. No, I, no idea on like social cues. Can't read people and shit. No self-awareness. No spatial awareness. No emotional IQ. No emotional EQ. Nada. Just goes. Reminds me of one papa. With people forming opinions not based on truth. Shin, I got in trouble for saying uninsecure. You need we need to talk about the incident that you had. I guess when you're in corporate, you gotta keep it corporate, man. We say exactly. nigga on the show. We say nigga all day on this motherfucking show. And it was a black woman who pulled me to the side. And this brother... Oh, hold on. You know what? Listen to this story, right? Listen to this story. Amanda Seals had an issue on set at Insecure, one of the many issues she had that eventually led to her not being, you know, back on Insecure, where she got into an altercation with a staff member because she called the guy a nigger. And I guess her justification for it is that they use that word on the show. The guy that was working is like, hey, we're not on the show now. We're like off, you know, we're not filming now. We're on set, you know, whatever. Not filming. You, you shouldn't say that. And Amanda Seals can't f work out in her brain why there are some things that you just can't say at work, even if you might say them whilst you're, like, working, technically. She can't work out in her head. And the funny thing about this is that this issue is a bit of a minor one. It was kind of blowing out of proportion, don't get me wrong. But she didn't even fathom in her brain just to say sorry and kind of get it over and done with. She still can't figure out why what she did was wrong and why it would have looked bad and why she's reprimanded. Like, she can't figure it out. This woman's fucking amazing. I was like, damn, you're the only revolutionary nigga around here. He was like, I'm not a nigga. And I said, okay, I get it. Um, hmm, this was the incident. So she's like, we need to talk about the incident. And I said, well... So, uh, and again, another trait of people that are like, super toxic. She's minimizing somebody else being upset about what you said, dismissing it. Oh, the incident. Bruh, they, they're employing you to do a job. They have some rules about the job. One of the rules you broke, be apologetic, promise you won't do it again and keep it moving. 
it really isn't that deep. But what you can't do is try and minimize, diminish, and just pure out, you know, dismiss what they're saying when they're the ones employing you, when they're the ones in charge, when they're the ones whose feelings were hurt. Just apologize and move on. But she cannot do that. She cannot do it. What incident? What incident? Well, when you just referred to him as... I'm pretty sure that in Django Unchained, uh, in the movie Django Unchained, Leonardo DiCaprio was not saying that word when they were just chilling. We say it on the movie. No, no, no. The movie said it's one thing. Yeah, just because in your lines it says, don't mean you just be out here in the random trailer. Be like, hey, bitch, bitch, oh, 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 that in the script, I'm saying do it called work. Exactly. And then cut, yo, bitch, are we going to lunch? Not kind of, it's not going to work. Exactly. exactly. So I actually re- I refer to him as a revolutionary nigga. It was a compliment. Right. You're going to need to apologize to him. Imagine somebody called her a revolutionary bitch. What, what do you think she'd say? If somebody said, hey, Amanda Seals, my revolutionary bitch. What, what would she say? How do you think she'd react if someone said that to her? Yo, Amanda Seals, my revolutionary bitch sister nigger. What, what do you think she would say to that? <laughs> but this is the action of like, I need to, you need to bow down. People are always trying to get me to like apologize for some shit I didn't do wrong right. because, they, because they feel like I'm too haughty. That's a very toxic trait, isn't it? To feel like people are pulling you up on your mistakes as a way to make you kiss their feet is such a toxic and mad way to look at interactions, right? Like, to you to think that every time somebody has an issue with you, they're almost trying to, like, put you beneath their feet. They're trying to take you down a notch. It's like, bruh, no, my feelings are hurt. You did something wrong. I'm telling you did something wrong. Like... Like a regular adult, like a regular human being, apologize, we move on. In her head, she sees it as like a, you're, it's, it's confrontational. It's th- like, it's just a weird way to, to, comp- to like compartmentalize or to process somebody having an issue with what you said and did. Like, it's amazing. I love this woman so much in a completely unironic way. They feel like I'm too sure of myself. They feel like I need to be cut down to size. No, they thought it was wrong. Nigga. <laughs> Got that to size. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if this is like the, as much as I love Dashno, sorry, Dashno, as much as RIP Dashno, by the way, as, loves, as much as I love Dame Dash, I wonder if this is the consequence of that legendary Dame Dash interview with um, The Breakfast Club. Do you remember, that was just before the pandemic, I think, right? Where he was like, oh, I don't have a boss. Um, I'm not going to look at another man and call him boss. All this sort of nonsense, right? It was at the start of all that kind of like CEO, boss, um, you know, money management, finance, gods, all that sort of nonsense online, right? That became like a movement. And I wonder if there are some people out there that took that stuff way too literally and now have this idea in their heads that they're like mini CEOs. Even though they work a job, they're like creative directors. No, I'm a, I'm a chief. I'm a di- like. They have this weird thing, this weird like ways that they look at themselves when they're working a regular job. So they, so whenever somebody tells them off, it reminds them that they're working a regular job, and they have to kind of fight against it. Be like, nah, I'm a boss. I'm a boss. Like, bro, relax. You're not a boss. That is your boss. If your boss says you did something wrong, you did something wrong. Apologize. And if you didn't do the thing wrong, just apologize anyway, and then come back later and say, hey, just want to let you know, I, I apologize, but I also want just give them, whatever. But in that moment, apologize so you can keep your job and everything could be fucking smooth. It's not that fucking deep. Not everybody's meant to be a CEO. No everyone's meant to be a fucking founder. No everyone's meant to be an entrepreneur. That whole stuff is nonsense. You need people to do the fucking medial jobs, to do the regular shit. You need people. You you need number twos. You need the first ten employees. You need these people. Having a having a job doesn't mean you're subservient. Doesn't mean you're a slave. Doesn't mean you're less than. It means you're a fucking grown up taking responsibility of your life and trying to support yourself and your family. It's not a fucking bad thing. It really isn't. And sometimes you might do things to people that you don't even know you did wrong. It's perfectly okay. But if that person says you did something that made them upset, and you as a as a as a colleague, as a fucking co-worker, do them the favor and just acknowledge that and say sorry. It's not that deep. It really isn't. Listen, I use the word mm-hmm. occasionally. 
I don't use it that often. You'd actually be surprised. Okay, we just you should just use it here. <laughs> Even here, like, a video. I, I might not say it for <laughs> once every like three videos. Press X about when we first started. We used to say it more. Yeah. Nowadays, we barely say it. Yeah, because you know flags. Not even that. I just as I got older, I just used the word less. Mm. That's honestly what it is. Wait, I swear less. I do most of those things less. Sure. But when we pass that, Concur. even when I did use it, there were people who were uncomfortable with the word. Mm. And if I, I would not just go to people I don't know that well. I'd be like, hey, nigga, give me that shit. Because they might take it the wrong way. And I would understand why. For you to be told by somebody, yo, don't call me that for what? And it's fair, too, because they might have a relationship with that word that's really negative. I know some people, when they hear that word, it triggers some shit in them. And that's okay. For you to be told, yo, you need to apologize for that. You'd be like, oh, they're just trying to put me down. They're just trying to make me bow down. No, man. You're on the job. You're using language that's incredibly inappropriate backstage exactly. to talk to people exactly. who you haven't even established a exactly. rapport with to use that word. I might be a, a, call them some of my homegirls the B word. Don't mean I'm going to go to a random girl on the job and just say that shit and think it's supposed to fly. And then if she gets offended, I don't have to apologize. Let's be honest about that word. It is incredibly controversial. We all agree on that. Anyone who says otherwise is lying to themselves. So if you know it, using it at work and then being reprimanded for it should be one of the least surprising things. But if someone tells me, yo, don't call, I'm not that. First thing I'm going to do is, well, shit, my, sorry, yeah. my bad. I'm not going to be like, you trying to, are you trying to put me in these shackles? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. But let's just keep watching, bro. The unfortunate part of that is that it's not a reflection of me. It's a reflection of them. Right. <laughs> because what is it about me that Shows makes you feel done. small? Shows and you want me to me. get down to your level. Why do you feel small? It's so patronizing. Anyway, to end this, to end this is this. I don't think there's anything wrong with being unlikable. I honestly do think nowadays with the way content generation works, with the way social media works, I think it's a superpower to know what people don't like about you. For me, for instance, I realize over the time that I've been doing content, mostly, you know, as consistently I've been doing over the last couple of years and so, I've noticed people have said again and again and again how much they dislike when I repeat stories, how much they dislike when I repeat things that I say, how much they dislike when I repeat things that I say, how much they dislike when I repeat things that I say. Now, I understand why people don't like that, but am I going to change that about myself? No. Do I understand their, you know, their grievance? And why that would make them annoyed and why that make them frustrated and why it make them make, might they make them X off my content on my streams. Pod, I get it completely. But not being aware of it and trying to pretend like it doesn't exist or acting as if they have a problem and you don't have a problem or as if it's a figment of their imagination is utterly bizarre. But more so in her case, because her annoyance isn't just a thing that she does. It's her entire personality, her brand. And I feel like Amanda Seals is missing out on so much money, on so much exposure, on so much greatness, because she hasn't tapped into, people just dislike her as a person. And I think a good example is like the, the fucking Paul brothers, Logan Paul and Jake Paul. They weaponized and kind of embraced how much they were disliked to their betterment. Right, in, the, in in order to like be successful in whatever field they're doing, for the boxing to wrestling to the prime, which is going a bit shaky now, but regardless, they really did a good job in trying in basically embracing what people don't like about them, not changing it, but also not not being aware of it. I think that's a superpower to to acknowledge. Okay, to people don't like me for this and that. I understand this, but I'm gonna lean into it because what it does is that the people that don't like you. I'm not going to stop watching you now because they hate watch you. And the people that like you are going to still like you because they like you for who you are. So you might as well just get two for one. You might as well lean into the people that like about you and then also kind of service your fans. But for some reason, Amanda Seals is stuck in the middle where she's almost trying to convince both sides that she's an amazing person when it's like, bruh, the people that don't like you are never going to like you regardless of what you say and do anyway. So you might as well just embrace it, lean into it and kind of use it to your flipping advantage. But when you're a professional victim, when all you see are heroes and villains, and you're some, you're always a villain. You're always sorry, the hero in every story. But you have a track record of falling out with everybody. Because that's the thing that's really wild about Amanda Seals. She has a track record in her professional career, falling out with absolutely everybody. And to me, it's a really good reminder as to that balance you need to have. 
maybe some people would think, oh, Shannon Sharp is too much of a coon, <clears throat> too much of a corporate shill, right? Whatever. But there's a balance to be had because maybe you don't want to be all the way on the Shannon Sharp, Stephen A. Sm Stephen A. Smith side of things when it comes to dealing with corporations or whatever it may be. Maybe you want to be, maybe, but then you also don't want to be on the Amanda Seals, yay, and Kanye West type of thing, right? You, you want to be somewhere in the middle. And I feel like being aware of that is really important because nowadays, especially with the way, you know, corporate corporations work and shit, I just think a lot of it comes down to being liked, like I honestly do. And it's an unfortunate thing. I think you realize that the more you kind of, you know, the more you grow up, uh, the more experience you have in different jobs, you realize that sometimes, or most of the time, it's almost like the same thing when people say when they say, oh, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. That's the unfortunate reality of life. I'm thinking now, another unfortunate reality of life, sometimes it really isn't about how good you are at the job. It's about whether or not you're liked. It really is. If you can do a mediocre job at work, but you're well-liked and you're always a pleasure to deal with, no, you're well-liked and you're always on time, those two things, people will put up with, with the fact that you put in shitty, mediocre work. They'll put up with the fact that you're positive around the office, you're on time for the most part, even though your work is fucking shitty. But if you have a stinky attitude, but you have great work, people will really would prefer not to you to be around. That's the reality of the situation. Um, that's why some workplaces that you go to, I've been in this situation myself where I kind of fucked myself, where I didn't really integrate myself with the, with the, with my teammates or my coworkers. I never went out to the drinks. I never attended the little birthday things where they go and have a cake or something. Like I didn't partake in anything. Do you know what I mean? And it was no surprise that those are also the jobs I had the worst time at. And I ended, ended up having to get my marching orders or I left myself because I didn't feel comfortable. But a lot of it has to do with just lowering your guard a little bit and just playing the game. It really isn't that difficult. You don't even have to do much. Even if you don't drink or anything, like just attend a little thing, chill out for an hour, and then just do the old French exit. I'm going to the bathroom and then just bounce. But if you just don't go, if you don't engage, if you don't participate in anything that your work colleagues get up to, it's not going to be a surprise when they kind of ice you out of anything and they kind of make you feel left out. They kind of make you feel less than. It's not that surprising. You know, humans are, you know, we, we are what we are in it. We're social creatures. And if that social element is missing, if that lack, if that likability element is missing, you're not going to be invited to anything. You know what I mean? You're not going to be felt met, made to feel welcome. And I feel like she's really doing herself a disservice again, like I said, because she's actually quite talented. She's actually got a range of skills. She's actually got a lot to give. But people don't want to work with her because she's such a nightmare to deal with, which is something that I've heard a lot in Hollywood. People always say that, in Hollywood or in the entertainment industry in general, if you don't hear about somebody, if you're like, oh, where did this so and so person go? Most of the reason why they're not around is number one, because they're not getting booked. And number two, because they're probably a pain in the ass to deal with and no one wants to deal with them and they're not getting booked. Those are usually the two main things. It's very rare that somebody just takes a voluntary time away from the industry. It's mostly, you know, it's kind of brought upon you because no one kind of wants to deal with you. So um, I really wish she would kind of figure it out. She's not ever going to figure it out because, you know, that's the way she kind of is. It kind of is what it is. And I guess we have to move on with that one. I guess we have to move on with that one. Okay, talk about moving on. We have to also give a shout out to one of my favorite brands and the best and, you know, the greatest streetwear brand of all time. Uh, I think I'll probably stand on that. It's probably easy to suggest that, especially when you see the fucking quality of their work over the last few years and whatnot supreme are going to be release a nike sb darwin low and again for me this is another recognition of the great work that they do because they've chosen a model that is severely overlooked a model that a lot of people don't really know too well and have presented at nike sb form and i think supreme needs to be given a lot of credit for never taking the easy route because the easy route with sbs is dunks nowadays jordans and whatever else model they have that's very popular but Supreme always tend to go their own route when it comes to doing Nike SB collaborations. Now, that could be because Nike SB tell them that they have to do the new thing. Maybe that's part of the process of the rollout. Maybe part of the rollout, like with some limited edition shoes, back in the day anyway, I'm not sure if it's the same thing anymore now, but back in the day, if there was, if there was a collaboration for a shoe, Nike would prefer, no, if there was a new model they wanted to put out, Nike would prefer to put it out first as a collaboration and then try to iterate it out. So if it was a if it was like a, a hybrid Air Max, they'd rather do a collaboration with Undefeated, with Neighborhood, with Pata, with Half, wherever it may be, 
and then have that be limited edition, introduce that to the market, and then roll out all the GRs. Same thing what they did with Supreme with that Air Max DN, which is one of the worst Air Maxes ever, but we'll talk about that another day. And then you release the GRs afterwards. But I feel like it's a big risk for Supreme on the SB front because Supreme have such a rich history of amazing dunks they've done in the past. So a lot of kids, you know, are probably buying the SBs because of their great race resale value and because they've got a lot of good, you know, they've got a lot of fucking um, good work on their books of what they've done previously. But I like that they always challenge themselves. They challenge the consumer with a new shape and a new model and set precedent out there and kind of do their own thing. So big up Supreme. So anyway, the blurb says, Nike has worked with Nike SB on, so no, Supreme has worked with Nike SB on a version of the Darwin Low Spring 2024. The Nike Air Darwin was originally released in 1994. Supreme and Nike SB um, have reinterpreted the Darwin with a canvas upper. The shoe features a, uh, what's that, a phylon midsole, rubber outsole, leather collar, fleece collar, and tongue lining, co-branded footbed, nylon webbing eyelets, webbing loop um, at heel, embroidered logo at eye stay, woven logo at type of the tongue, leather loop applique on the heel, made exclusive for Supreme, for Darwin Low, will be offered in four colorways. By the way, Supreme have the best product descriptions ever. Um, I think Palace still do that kind of cringy mandem talk on their product blurb and stuff, and it's fucking dumb and redacted. But I feel like Supreme do a really good job in terms of like, you know, describing <laughs> all the bits of the shoe and break it down in exhaustive detail. It kind of makes you want to geek out on these little things. Anyway, regardless, the actual shoe itself is pretty cool. The Darwin essentially basically looks like a an SB version of the Nike, no, of the Jordan S, of the Jordan 11, right? I think, if I'm not mistaken. A Darwin kind of looks like a Jordan 11. So if I, if I go in here, I think a Darwin kind of looks like a Jordan 11. You see, uh, uh, Jordan 11. That's what it kind of looks like. See what I'm talking about? Yeah, so it's kind of a, it's kind of Jordan 11-y looking wise, as you can see from the picture that's available there on the screen. It kind of looks a bit like a Jordan 11. So I quite like how they sort of like flip that in that regard. Anyway, let's go back to Supreme Blurb and let's see the other pictures of the other colorways. So you have a, a featured here with some satin pants that the person's wearing here on the, on the thing. Um, you've got this canvas upper, which looks pretty cool. And I love the backwards or the backwards swoosh on the on the shoe as well. Um, obviously, we liken a lot of that backwards stuff to um, the Travis Scott Jordans. But I like to see it applied this way. I think it looks pretty cool there. There's also a version that comes in a camo. I think this is the same colorway they have on a backpack as well. It looks pretty cool. So you have there as well, featured with the socks available there and the long shorts. Oh, the black colorway looks super hard, isn't it? I'm not going to lie. The black colorway looks absolutely really tough. You've got this nice black nylon, um, total blacked out. You've got a nice little Supreme pull tab there on the side. And you've also got this massive crisp white swoosh on the back of the heel. It's also available in this lime green colorway as well also the lime green and all black color are definitely my favorites i'm not gonna lie that lime green and all black color are definitely my favorites obviously the canvas upper is a good idea for skateboarding um it allows you to kind of you know do all your flip tricks and shit and whatnot without getting your shoes all bust up they're probably going to be a little bit more um durable especially when they're grabbing against the grip tape all the time so that makes a lot of sense um i love the all blacked outsole and midsole um sometimes with these type of shoes it's nice to kind of break them up but i kind of like how they kind of all black on the outsole Looking at the shape again, I know they kind of look like a Jordan 11, as I said before. I know they kind of got like Jordan 11 vibes to it, right? But, you know, another thing I kind of noticed with this um, Darwin, actually just checking this out now. I think this Darwin as well, weirdly, 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 weirdly. I don't sure if you guys agree, but it kind of looks a little bit similar to a, um, what do you call it? To a climbing shoe, to a bouldering shoe. Don't you get that kind of vibe? If you look at this shoe and you kind of squint, they kind of look a little bit, I know they've obviously got a similar silhouette to a Jordan 11, but they look a little bit similar to like bouldering shoes. Um, I'm sure most of you guys know people in your community who do bouldering because it's becoming one of the fastest growing sort of like things people do in their spare time. Uh, I see a lot of my friends get into that or flipping snooker, no sorry snooker, playing golf. But I feel like bouldering shoes have that kind of similar sort of vibe. So they kind of have a bit of a bouldery shoe vibe about them right as you can see here these bouldering shoes they do when you're climbing and shit so they kind of got a bit of that feel to them as well so that's pretty cool which makes sense as well because i'd imagine if you're going to design if you're going to design a perfect skateboarding shoe maybe you would borrow some elements of bouldering shoes because bouldering shoes probably have a lot of grip underneath right they're probably made of some sort of composite some sort of rubber composite that kind of allows it to stick and to grip 
on the boulders a lot easier than regular sneakers, low profile, whatever it may be. And those things will also be beneficial if you're going to create a really good sticky, um, you know, skateboarding shoe to kind of, you know, stick on the grip tape on the deck, whatever it may be. So maybe that's where the inspiration comes from. Who knows? I'm just rambling here. Obviously, you've got them in the neon. Nice. I like the way they look there. And then you've also got them in the camo that's also available. So they look pretty cool. I think they're going to be dropping this Thursday. So check them out on Supreme website if you like them. For me personally, I'd go for the all blacks and the greens. If you're ever wondering which would be my pick, I'd definitely say the lime greens and the all black are definitely my favorites. And Supreme does it again. Supreme does it again. They always do it. They always smash it. And I love it. I absolutely love it. Moving on from that one. So um, there's this pretty cool thing I forgot to mention about Coachella. So I watched Coachella performances over the last, what, whenever they came on. Um, the weekend was pretty pretty sick, I'm not going to lie. Production-wise, Coachella can't be touched when it comes to live streaming. I think the only people that did a similar type of job might have been Boiler Room, but on a very smaller scale. Whenever Deck Mantle came around, the festival over there in Holland. Uh, but obviously, in recent years, I think that partnership has kind of ended, and now it's with horror and horror going through what they're going through. But regardless, that kind of large-scale live streaming production that Coachella do, I would love to know if they actually make anything from it. Does it actually... Is it just a, is it a lead generator? Does it help them break even? Or is it just one of those things that they do for marketing that just, you know, it, it loses the money, but it's worth the time because the sound, the visuals, you know, the ease of use of having to flip between different stages on one channel or one page is really good, bro. They must invest a lot of money into that. And I've read that this year's Coachella was one of the lowest attendance ones. They had loads of tickets still available. People didn't turn up on the day, blah, 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 blah. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but regardless, it seems like every year the demand or the hype of Coachella kind of dies. I'm not too sure if that is because, you know, of the economy we're in at the moment, um, whether it's because there's a lot of domestic festivals now in most Western countries that are pretty decent to go to. So you don't really need to go to destination festivals anymore for the most part. I don't know. And of course, the streaming platform of it kind of makes it a little bit null. Do you know what I mean? It kind of makes it a bit mute. Why would you bother even going to Coachella when they have such an amazing um, live streaming element to it? Yes, I know it's not the same as going there, but really and truly, especially considering some of the acts that are performing there, seeing them perform live might be the best thing than you know standing in a you know in a space of a hundred thousand people trying to squint as you watch fucking Ice Spice shake her ass on stage. Anyway, all that to be said, quick observations regarding it. Number one, I realize why people on YouTube don't talk about Coachella. I played a video like where I was talking about Coachella, talking about Grimes, how she redeemed herself and shit. And the whole entire video got blocked. And I don't care about that stuff, really. Um, especially when they do the whole copyright claim. It's their content. But bruh, let it play on YouTube. You don't need to block the whole thing. You can take the money, whatever fucking two cents you take from it. Do whatever you need to do. It's your content that I'm obviously ripping off of. But blocking the entire thing is wild. But it also explains why I don't really see, you don't really see a lot of like commentary, content about Coachella on the platform uh, on this platform sorry unless it's people actually there vlogging their experience but if you take anything from the Coachella live streams they smack down and block your shit ASAP so that was quite wild but also again a reminder why I don't see a ton of people doing much Coachella content on YouTube or any podcast for that extent because no one wants to deal with that nonsense but regardless I saw this really cool thing um where just before um Patrick Mason played um he played after this person called Reiner Zon, Zon, Zonneveld, Reiner Zonneveld, right? And when he came on stage, you know what's pretty cool about this? I'm not sure if you can see this here while I play on the screen. Before he came on stage, there's this motorized DJ boofing, which I hadn't seen before. Pretty sick. So um, from what I can understand, when it, goes, when it comes to these type of big festivals, or big festivals in general, whenever a DJ is playing, they usually will just have like two setups done. So when one DJ is playing on the left-hand side and that person's about to come on, they'll just get that other DJ set up on the right-hand side. So, you'd have to sw so you, just, you don't have to do the whole weird pause and wait for them to set up the other DJ booth because every DJ might have a different setup. Might, someone might free decks. Someone, someone might want you know, a different kind of mixer, whatever it may be. But with this particular festival, uh, Co Coachella, they have a fucking motorized DJ booth thing that kind of slides out. So when he's just playing, he does his thing, and then your one kind of slides along with all your fucking, you know, your shit already plugged in and stuff. It's pretty fucking cool. And um, that, again, must cost them an arm and a leg. So you can see it kind of rolling in there as Patrick Mason kind of waits to kind of get started. I saw, I saw that. I was like, you know what? That's pretty fucking sick. 
that's enough. That's probably a biggest reminder that you've made it. Honestly, that's probably the biggest reminder that you've made it when you go play a an event <laughs> and they've got a motorized DJ booth that kind of, you know, zips into frame as you're about to play. It's the complete opposite of my playing experience. Like I go to pubs and clubs and shit to play and legitimately sometimes I'll get there and there'll be no knobs on the mixer. No knobs. They've all been taken. I don't know if somebody robbed them. I'm not sure if they lost them in transit, bringing the mixer from downstairs in the fucking staff room, covered in beer piss, and they're giving it to you. I'm not sure if somebody else nicked them to put on their own mixer at home. But sometimes you go to an event and legitimately the mixer doesn't work. Or my favorite, my favorite is this. I'll be playing in a bar in a pub. I'll rock up and they'll say, yeah, we've got CDJs. You rock up to play in the CDJs and they've got like, you know, one 400, one 1,000, whatever. But one deck doesn't have the pitch, doesn't work. The pitch control doesn't work. So you can't really mix. Like you have to just, you know what I mean? You have to either stick to one tempo or just try and figure it out. It's fucking hilarious because I remember in the beginning, I used to get really flustered with that sort of stuff. But now I've kind of realized where I'm at DJ wise, booking wise. I know what equipment I'm, I, I know what to expect in terms of the equipment I'm going to use. So when I run into an issue, I just immediately adapt. I never try and fix it. I'm not trying to put my hand up to get the fucking, you know, manager's attention and ask questions. No, no, no. Wherever they brought me is what they have. They don't have anything else downstairs. There's not a secret DJ, DJM 900 down there that's completely brand new that I can use. Whatever they have, I have to make work. And now I've gone as far as doing this. I've gone as far as doing that I'm actually going to buy um, I forgot what it is. I think it's an entry level D DJ and mixer. I think it might be, if I'm not mistaken, like a 250. I think that's what it is. I think I'm gonna get a Pioneer. This what, what is it? DJM. That's it. 250. So this is what I'm actually gonna do going forward for my gigs. I'm actually gonna buy this entry level DJ and mixer, which is really good. A standard two channel mixer from uh, Pioneer has all the necessary effects that you need to kind of use them with. But this will save me all the trouble in the world because sometimes, well, most of the time, anyway, I'd say the 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 most common kind of like tech error I run into is the mixer. The mixer is usually the most shoddy thing, like you know, faulty port, fa sorry, faulty ports, missing knobs, and just generally just covered in beer piss and doesn't work properly. But if you have a decent mixer, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. This is definitely going to negate my fee, right? Like if I'm getting paid. $100 or oh, sorry, 100 pounds to play somewhere and drink tokens. This fucking mixer alone is like 200 quid <laughs> or 300 quid, right? So whatever fee I'm getting, I'm negating it, but it gives me the peace of mind of knowing that I can plug in my shit and the sound is going to come through the way that, that way that it sounds in my headphones. It's not going to sound all muffled and fucked up. So that kind of, kind of work in that regard. So that's kind of me, but it's just funny to see the the, the difference like i'm i'm rocking up to fucking for my future you know bookings i'm rocking up with my headphones different cables backup usbs all this gear plus a mixer that i'm gonna plug in there while my guy patrick mason is just standing there with his headphones in his hand and this amazing designer shirt and this motorized dj booth rocks up with a rotary mixer and two pioneer cdjs the latest ones on either side so four cdj deck set up and a rotary mixer <laughs> it's like the contrast is fucking amazing i fucking love it i absolutely love it but anyway big up patrick mason as well by the way um even though i didn't love the set personally the music isn't for me i think i love and appreciate patrick mason more so as a dj because i i remember seeing his come up i remember watching him on horse streams i remember watching him perform i forgot what that what that bar is in berlin but it was this outside bar thing that was like popping off during COVID that everyone was kind of going to. He was playing there quite often. And generally, he just seemed like a scene guy. Like, he kind of seemed like, you know, like how I would be back in the day, performing at home. Like, you know, I stopped doing that now because they were some of the worst gigs ever. On paper, they look amazing, performing at fucking hotel lounges. But when you do them in practice, they're fucking soul-destroying. Like, there's nothing worse than performing at a fucking hotel lounge bar and trying to play, like, cool background music. And then every two seconds, have someone come over saying, Kilo the song, look. Fuck off, right? So, whatever. But he's come from that world. He's come from performing, you know, at the Shoreditch houses, at random places for 100 euros, and now he's performing at Coachella. I think that's an amazing thing because what that shows you is there's definitely a route for everybody to kind of get to that level. 
this regardless of your come up, especially if you're a non-producing person, because the stigma around oh no, the the common held belief is that to be at this kind of level, you need to produce. Well, Patrick hasn't really been known for producing. He, he has produced some stuff. Don't get me wrong. Um, but most of his success has come from his personality, how he acts behind the stage, he's dancing, all this type of stuff. But it's it's mostly to do with his ability to DJ. So that's kind of a. Ex I think people like this should be a better example for people than you know whatever else person that exists out there because he's legitimately come from the bottom all the way up to the top. But yeah, I thought the motorized DJ booth thing was fucking hilarious. I've never actually seen that in real life, but it is another reminder of just how much money goes behind putting on fucking Coachella and what they do over there. A second thing that I thought was really interesting about the Coachella thing was this. So big up my girl Peggy Goo, right? Peggy Goo, big up the one and only Peggy Goo. Peggy Goo performed, and I'm not going to lie, Peggy Goo absolutely killed it. Like, no cap. Like, she fucking smashed it. The visuals were fucking fire. Um, her behind the booth, have, like, I've, I've always said, like, say what you want about Peggy Goo, but one thing she does immensely well is that she's a professional. She does, she, she plays Starry Night like it's her fucking first time. She plays that na 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 tune like it's her first time. Like she's giving you a show. She's not boring. She's having a fucking blast. She's wearing color. She's smiling behind the fucking booth, right? Even if it is performative, at least she's having a fucking good time there and not looking dour and just staring down at the street at the fucking decks like most DJs do. But, but that being said, I found the inclusion of these what I would like to label, you know, LGBTQ plus community people on stage dancing to be kind of gross, kind of uh, performative, kind of, it, you know, it's almost like she was using these people to appear like she's an ally. And I'm not going to lie. Again, I'm not one to say who's an ally and who isn't, but I never even knew Peggy had this element in her music. Like when was when has Peggy ever been for the gays? I don't know. Like I've never ever she she went from being kind of unknown to being super successful and really big, but she was never somebody that really championed the LBGTQ plus community. I don't really remember that to be a thing. And now suddenly she's got these guys and gals right um, dancing on stage and like basically giving her legitimacy in that community when she's done nothing for it. And I can't figure out why. Maybe this that like, Nana Na song is very popular and the gays and the girls like it a lot. Fair enough. But I felt like this was incredibly exploitive. She, it's almost like she was exploit. Yeah, it, she, it feels like she was exploiting the LGBTQ community. But maybe I'm reading, I'm reading too much into it. Maybe I missed that part where Peggy Goo was a big ally and she was performing at Hull. She was at Inferno. She was at all these big flipping LGBTQ plus friendly places and spaces. But she's never been that girl. She's always been booked and busy at the biggest raves, the most baitest ones, the most commercial ones, the ones that are attended by the most cisgendered males ever, right? And now here she is using gay people on stage to make herself look cool. It's like, bruh, what the fuck? This is like, this is like, do you remember back in the day when that like, Footlocker and JD Sports would have adverts and they have adverts of like black people like spray painting and break dancing and shit. This is almost like that kind of thing. Like, yeah, we're urban, we're cool. It's like, come on, Peg. Come on, lady. But again, that aside, she killed it. She smashed it. But I don't like this performative type of stuff. And again, maybe it isn't performative. Maybe I missed a trick. Maybe I don't know that she's really about this life. Who knows? But I've never really seen this about herself. And now all of a sudden, she's on stage with these dancers like she's in fucking Pasha. And I can't quite work out what the fuck is going on. I really can't work out what's going on. But maybe I missed a trick. Maybe I'm not really super plugged in. That's okay if that's true. That's okay if that is true. Big up Peggy Goo regardless. Big up Peggy Goo regardless. Talking about Peggy Goo. Talking about Peggy Goo, we have to talk about her amazing cover feature on the magazine Le Official or Le Official. Le Official, Le Official. And another reminder of like, this woman is booked and busy. And, 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 personality aside, we have to ask, have to admit, she looks amazing in clothes, isn't it? Let's just admit, let's just say it out loud. This woman looks very, very good in clothes. Like personal style maybe isn't for me, but whatever. 
But when she when she has to dress dress, when she has to put herself forward in a magazine and get that editorial done, she knows how to put that shit on. She got that shit on, girl. She got that shit on. So this is courtesy of Leo Fischel. The title is Peggy Goo Pressures Herself on the Heels of Her First Album. And obviously you see her looking... I'm not going to lie. This is giving me Susie Bubble vibes. If you know OG London Street style, you know, Phenom, she's kind of looking like Susie Bubble. But regardless, I'm loving the trim, loving the look regardless. The dress is made by Marnie. The earrings by Swarovski. Again, booked and busy. Like, could you imagine what her DJ fee is, by the way? Not a pocket watch, but let's pocket watch. Could you imagine what Peggy Goo's DJ fee must be? She must not get out of bed. She must not fucking wash her pussy for like less than 100 grand. It's impossible. You couldn't probably get her to fucking brush her teeth less than fucking 250. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? She is booked and busy. So it continues. Let's read the actual interview because I'm curious to see what she has to say. Um, interested to find out she's only 32. It feels like she's been around for fucking ever. So big up her for that regard. You got another real cool shoe of her there wearing um, head to toe Prada. Looking fucking phenomenal. So let's read the actual interview what she has to say. So, um, <laughs> what is your first memory? Okay, I love these I love these questions in interviews because everybody lies. And I would wish some people just like tell the truth. It's almost like the American Idol X Factor questions. The question is, what is your first memory related to music? And everyone says the same thing. Everyone's like, oh, when I was 10, my dad would be singing, um, I don't know, Phil Collins songs in the kitchen. My mom would be playing fucking Aerosmith songs on the drums. Like, it's always this nonsense. It's like, bruh, why can't you just tell the truth and say, yeah, I don't know. One day I was watching MTV. I saw a fucking Jamiroquai music video and I was like, oh shit, I want to do that. And I started looking into music and I don't know, it's just the common story that we all have. You just discovered on your own. Your parents weren't fucking musicians. They weren't fucking, you know, uh, failed artists and shit. They're just regular people that gave birth to you doing their own thing and you happen to find music yourself. Like all these lies about everybody being this, like my whole family's full of musicians, it's fucking bullshit. But anyway, regardless, everyone kind of makes up their own narrative, tell their own story, invent your own nostalgia, imagine nostalgia, big up Lucian Smith, let's continue. Her answer, well, it depends on what kind of music you're talking about. See, look at her. In her Korean household, everything was played from jazz to heavy metal to disco to pop to rap, R&B, funk, soul. <laughs> you got a lot, Peggy Goo. Uh, well, it depends on what kind of music you're talking about. If you're talking about classical, I learned how to play piano when I was eight years old. Really? That, no way. An Asian girl that can play piano. I'm fucking shocked. What next? The violin? Before that, when I was six, I was in a choir. I don't believe that, by the way. Have you heard a singing voice? I don't know. I don't know about that. There's a song with Peggy Goo and, and Lenny Kravitz on, and it might be one of the worst songs I've heard in my life. That's why I'm hoping the album doesn't sound like that, because bloody hell, their voices would make me sound like fucking Chris Brown. Um, before that, I was six in the choir. I was also playing this. I don't know what it's called in English. It's called a zig, um, a zing, like a gong. But a, so she, she's, she's bragging about playing the triangle in a band. Come on, Peggy. You, you're bragging about playing the triangle. But the first time with electronic music, I would say I was 16. Okay, thank God she didn't lie too much there. Let's continue. You're from South Korea. Do your heritage and culture influence your music? By the way, I hate this question too. The whole culture stuff is like, bruh, like, what? Huh? Hey, actually, does your blackness influence your... Is that what? What does that even fucking mean? Anyway, let's continue. I have a Korean idol who I'm lucky to be friends with. Her name is Jung, Jungwa. I've been listening to her K-pop since I was a kid. I think that's my first memory. Okay, didn't really answer the question. But anyway, continues. What does being a DJ mean to you? I don't only see myself as a DJ. You see? I told you guys. I made the prediction. That Peggy Goo is definitely going to go more down the artist way. So I expect this album that she's about to put out on XL Records to be more of a um, an announcement of her as an artist, unless as a DJ. That's what I predict. I think she's going to go full hog. Because I think Nina Kravitz and those type of people, they're, they're probably a bit too shy to really step out and be an artist artist and like put a bit decks behind her. But I think she's probably a bit bored of playing, you know, of DJing. Obviously, it's easy money, but she probably would prefer to be a legit, like, you know, 
have music videos where she's like fucking dancing and all this sort of shit. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to see that happening soon. You're going to see Peggy in some sort of choreography. You might see her with a tune featuring Lato on it or some shit. Don't be, don't, don't be surprised if you see her doing an Ice Spice remix. That's happening. Um, yo, one of them, so what she says, I don't see myself as a DJ. I feel, I feel like I'm more than just that. But a DJ is someone who's deducing people, who's educating people about music and is responsible for creating a really good vibes. You're one of the most powerful women in the industry. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I was, I've, I don't know if she's powerful. I think she's infamous. She's definitely infamous. I, I, I'm not sure about powerful. But anyway, what do I know? Thank you so much for saying that. <laughs> I've always thought that myself. I've always known I was powerful. But people, anyway, thank you for reminding me. Um, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that people see it that way. I worked quite hard to get to my position. X for doubt. I earned it by not taking shit from other people. I believe that to be fair and i keep doing me to be fair the first bit earned you know debatable not taking shit from people something people don't give a credit for i don't think there's many especially especially the guys there's a lot of men in electronic music who hate peggy goo i find her fascinating i don't really fucking hate her personally i find her fascinating just as a as a person to observe from afar but i know there's loads of guys that hate her and are really jealous and shit but i honestly think not there's not many guys out there that could put up with the shit that she gets. Like if they were put in her shoes, like yes, the money's good, whatever. And the fame, all that malarkey, the clout, cool. But having to put up with the constant scrutiny, the constant hating. Cause imagine, you know, already people in the comments are awful. Imagine the random unsolicited, you know, unrequested, uninvited, <laughs> fucking abuse she gets on the DMs. It must be wild. So I don't think they'll be able to put up with it. So the fact that she always seems to put up with it, doesn't rarely claps back really in public shows up on time does her job plays like plays starry night like it's her first time you have to give her fucking credit most people out there don't do that sort of shit and couldn't if they'll put in her shoes so that's something that she should be commended about it continues the bigger i get i feel like i have more responsibility for passing along the positive message and being a good example that type of compliment only inspires me to do better to be fair to her also I have to be honest too. I've long said, I really don't understand why in the DJ culture, it's not really a done thing to kind of bring people up. You don't really see people like putting their arms around somebody saying, yeah, this is my up and coming person who I think is amazing. I'm going to take them on tour with me and I'm going to blow them up. It doesn't really happen. Um, the last thing I can, you know, unless they're in a relationship, right? Um, well, what's her name? Uh, Amelia Lenz and her fella, right? Amelia Lenz and her husband. She basically gets him gigs now because she's fucking Amelia Lenz. Uh, Daria Kolosova and what's his face? They play together, but they're fuck. They're a couple, and they were probably quite established before they got together. But you don't really see a lot of DJs kind of putting their arms around people. It's not really a done thing. Everyone kind of gets in by themselves and just holds all of it by themselves. It's a really interesting scene in that regard. There's not really a lot of a spreading of the love. But to give props to Peggy, she was the first person I see on her level to have a way to bring people up because I think she's she's brought up. For, again, these people are legit in their own ways, but she's not going to have a way to invite... She's going to have a way to, like, put her arm around people like Sally C, people like um, FKA, 4A, however you say his name, and a few other people. And I'm sure that's definitely helped them in terms of getting other gigs, just making them more visible and shit. And that's something she has to be commended for because, you know, this woman's making fucking Solomon money and she's still spreading the wealth, which she doesn't need to do, but she's still doing it. So props to her for that as well. Let's continue here on this fucking shoot. You see her wearing another amazing thing as well here. Big up Peggy. Let's let it to load one second and we can continue. Where is it? Can I see it? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Is it going to look? Okay, there we go. So there's... Oh, this is a lot. I love this outfit. Top skirt and shoes by Ferragamo. Yeah, she looks amazing as Ferragamo. I'm not going to lie. Um, you continue. How did you conceive your debut album, I Hear You, coming out in June? And again, the big up her for the... This is also refreshing too. I long for the days of like proper album rollouts. Like she's promoting this album way, way, way ahead of time. This is fucking beautiful to see. For any musician, any album is very important. Step in their career. I have only done EPs with three or four songs. Now it's my first album in my music career. See, another hint that she's going to pivot away from the DJ. Music career. More than just the DJ. Anyway, which is a very important moment for me. I have been working on this for a long time, so I'm kind of nervous and excited at the same time. What can I say? 
I will have to let other people to hear it and let them judge. It's personal. I've been working a lot on this and I'm influenced a lot by 90s music. I feel very excited about it. It will almost feel like giving birth to your baby. I'm really anxious to see it, to be fair. Um, I've said already my prediction is going to be more artistry based. You might see and hear a lot more vocals on it. I'm also got a feeling it's going to be very, it's going to be like a range. As she said already, she's into night music. I feel like it's going to be everything that she's kind of into. Chicago House, Acid House, um, Deep House, whatever, all that kind of variance. Maybe there'll be some breakbeats involved in there. I think it'll kind of go on a bit of a journey, but I think there'll be definitely a lot more vocals on it because she's probably going to step out and be more of a performer um, in front of the booth instead of behind it. Do you feel under pressure considering it's your first album? Yeah, but pressure is never a bad thing for me. I pressure myself because I know I can do better. After one album, I'm probably going to think to myself, I could have done that better, but no, no bad pressure. Yeah, just do better. She says, the reaction, the reaction to It Goes None and That was crazy. I did not expect that. So when you get uh, a song like that, I do feel pressure sometimes, thinking, oh my God, I need to make more bangers like this all the time. But this album is not really about making bangers only. It also shows people my taste, the different genres of music that I love. See, I told you about genres. I knew it. My prediction's right again. To be fair, that must be kind of wild, isn't it? To just happen to, again, whether or not you believe she does the tunes or not, but imagine you're somebody that gets lucky enough to just create two legit bangers in Na Na Na. No, it goes, yeah, it goes like, and obviously Starry Night. And, um, in such a short career already, and you've got so much ahead of you to do. It must be its own type of golden handcuffs because now people only expect bangers from you. And maybe those are, you were just, you know, just luck thing. You just happen to make two bangers back to back, but you have other things that you kind of want to show people, other sides of yourself, other genres, take them on a bit of a journey, but they just want that boom, 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 boom. So, Maybe this is a this maybe this will be her time to kind of reset things and get things back to where it needs to be. You never know. Another one. Did you realize at some point that you created a global hit with Nana? Na? Yes, I did. Because for example, in Italy, it was a top of Spotify. Italy has been supporting my music since my first show in Italy in 2016, maybe 2015. To be fair, that's that makes sense. When I first heard it goes like, I still fucking hate it to this day. But I was like, oh, this is fucking horrendous. But it was also the kind of song that you could hear be very successful what's that fucking festival i think it's like kappa future or something it's the one i think it's in florence or something it's like in an open air place i was like okay those guys those madmen in italy who like to sing along to bass lines they're definitely gonna like this shit and no surprise of course number one in italy so you know maybe it's not for me but i knew for sure it goes like would definitely resonate with some people out there i just think it's incredibly cheesy and unfortunately it doesn't have the same replay value as starry night even though Starry Night is quite corny to play nowadays, I feel like it still has a lot more replay value. I don't think that, you know, it goes like we'll, we'll have the replay value in like a year's time, even. Do you know what I mean? It's going to feel very, very dated. It continues. Actually, even before I had absolutely any music out, I did it in Italy in 2011 at this fashion party. But anyway, go back to Na Na Na. That's a brand thing to mention. Uh, I remember my song at the top of Italian um, top 10. I, every other song was Italian song. That meant so much for me. In general, Italy is one of my favorite places to play. The crowd has always given me good energy. It's funny she says that. And she's also, you know, on one video with these people dancing on the stage, like she's some LGBTQ advocate, because those Italian festivals are known to be incredibly heteronormative, right? It's just full of just dudes. You look at the fucking crowd, it's just full of dudes all the same basically all dark hair all beards all black t-shirts gurning off their fucking faces so i love that her favorite place to play is italy <laughs> which is one of the most normie generic places to go to but yeah bring up pay you regardless uh let's continue here what else does she say let's go along there's her with, oh ginger ginger peggy goo keb peggy goo i'm not mad at that at all what's what's the dress who's addressed by Trapparelli, Jesus! Imagine her turning up to a fucking gig in head to toe fucking Trapparelli. Imagine that. Could you, like has, has there been a DJ who's actually worn couture behind the booth, <laughs> like legit couture behind the booth? Like her, this outfit could be more than her appearance fee. That's the funny thing. This outfit could be more than her actual DJ booking fee, which is wild because you know her DJ booking fee is probably high, but that dress might be two hundred grand plus or something. Fuck. Let's continue. Um, in November 2023, you did a really great single. With... No, nah, that's not. Again, Lil Fishiao, you're lying. In November 2023, you did a really great single with Lenny Kravitz. How was your first professional meeting? I, by the way, I don't understand why that song exists. I don't know 
why that Peggy Goo Lenny Kravitz song exists. It sounds awful. Lenny sounds awful. Uncle Lenny Kravitz sounds awful. Peggy Goo sounds awful. The beat is fucking awful. It's garbage. It's one of the worst songs I've ever heard. I don't know if they just hooked up one day and decided to jump into a booth. I don't know if just they got inspired by each other's fucking outfits or something. Whatever that song, however it came to be, it just needs to be thrown in the bin. That song is tr -tr -tr trash. So bad. It continues. When I first met Lenny, I was super... Oh, she calls him Lenny. Hello. Lenny. Big L, eh? Um, when I first learned Lenny, I was super nervous. I think he's the most hottest, coolest person in the world. I went to see him in Bahamas in his studio where we were jamming together. I actually went to his studio again in Paris, an amazing studio. He's such a perfectionist. He knows what he wants and he knows exactly how he wants things to be done. <laughs> I'm also like that. In the beginning, we were like, okay, you want to do this? What about like this? Where's all this compromising? But in the end, he was super happy and I'm very grateful that he gave me this chance. Okay, how do you describe your musical style? I like to describe my style. I'd rather let other people describe it. When it comes to fashion, I like to wear everything. When it comes to music, I like to listen to every genre. Oh, okay, everything. Come on, bro. Let's be specific a little bit, right? Let's hone in on what we like. Let's not say we like everything. I'm into a bit of everything. Like, come on, girl. Give us, give us more than this. I like, um, I select things, the sound that I like, I put it together, it becomes my thing, I don't want to put a label on it, I remember the first thing I started to DJ, I told myself, I'm going to be a house DJ, but most of the DJs that love, they don't only play house music, they play everything, but that's an interesting point she made there, and something that has always bugged me about DJing, it seems like DJs have to specialise, have to hone in on a particular genre, I don't know exactly why, and when this happened, but it seems to be a thing. You have to kind of push yourself as like a techno DJ, hardcore DJ, break beats, break beats DJ, disco DJ, party DJ. Like you can't just do what DJs did in the past and play based on where you're at, what you're feeling, what the vibe is. There has to be a genre. And it's annoying because I feel like, for instance, like Bergheim, one of my favorite clubs in the world, even though they have different rooms in Bergheim and Panorama Bar, and people split it like Panorama Bar is obviously the house and Bergen is mostly techno. I don't see like a genre thing. I see it more like a vibe thing. So yes, they're probably split with genres, but it's more so a vibe. House music and that kind of stuff and more party, light, you know, loving, bright, smiley shit fits more in Panorama Bar. Whereas the dark, you know, um, atmospheric, journey-led things probably fit more in Bergheim. And same thing goes with the other room, Saul, how do you pronounce it? Different types of music and vibes fit different spaces. But in general, you'd think a DJ's role would be to figure out, or job spec, would be to figure out what type of thing works in what type of room. But it shouldn't be limited on genres because there's some disco tunes you could listen to that are very menacing, very dark, very somber, very depressing, that could probably fit in Bergheim. But just because it's disco, it doesn't mean you only could play in panel bar. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like the genre thing is lame, especially nowadays too, because I feel like we don't really have a lot of like DJs that have great taste in music. A lot of it is bangers led. A lot of it is like what's hot in the moment, you know, whatever, jumping on a trend. But it's not really people playing the things that they love or taking people on the journey or kind of, as you said, quote unquote, educating people. But I feel like if you actually had a return to like no genres, and that people playing what they actually wanted to play, you'd see people, you'd hear people playing way more interesting things on the dance floor. That's just my hypothesis. I could be wrong. I could be right. Who knows? It continues. Speaking of fashion, what about your clothing brand, Peggy Goods? Peggy Goods is fashion, but it's more merch. I have many creative fans who like to, who want to like to illustrate or draw. So Peggy Goods is something that I'm doing to connect with my fans. Of course, I love fashion and the brand I'm into these days is Bottega Veneta. Matteo Blasi, the brand's creative director, is doing a really good job. I was in Milan for that show. Hmm, interesting way to end it. Um, I quite like her Peggy Goods brand. I think it's I think it's pretty cool. I'm not sure if she still does stuff with it, but I like that she has merch. Um, I feel like more DJs should make more merch. I like that her merch just isn't black t-shirts. That's one thing I like. It continues here. And I read that you also had a brand in the past, Kirin, the Virgil Abloh helped you with. Yeah, oh, yeah, true. She had that brand, didn't it? What happened to that, by the way? Um, yes, Virgil suggested to me 
the company that he was working with. He basically went up to them saying, you have to work with her. I think that's New Guard's group. Um, that was my little greediness trying to catch two rabbits in one same time. So I decided to do merch on the side. My love of fashion is always there. But when it comes for me time to focus on music, I should focus on that full time. Well, she's got a lot of things that she can do. Post DJ career, she could literally get into quite a few things in it. So that's probably why it makes people a lot of people mad because you could definitely see her doing pretty well if she decided to, you know, do the fashion thing full time, have LVMH or carrying all these companies, put some money behind her, her front of brand, and push that out. That could probably work. I'm not gonna lie. So big up her in that regard. But yeah, um, cool story here with Leo Fischel. Check it if you haven't already. Um, she looks amazing. Really good editorial. I love the stuff that she's wearing. She styled, um, you know, in, she styled in, she styled perfectly. Um, great hair and makeup, obviously on the shoot itself. She's fucking dressed to the nines, and maybe a reminder as you know, she might not be the most technically proficient, amazing DJ out there. Cool, but one thing that she is is a fucking star. That's something that you cannot deny. And clearly, she looks good when she puts that shit on. Like she's got this, you know, statement piece, Bottega Veneta um, outfit on or dress from their latest collection that looks fucking incredible on her as well. Connections, obviously, with all the high fashion brands out there. She's fucking killing it. So big up Peggy Goo. Big up Blood Clark, Peggy Goo. You love to see it. You really, really do love to Blood Clark see it. We have to talk about my favorite guy, Tremaine Emery. Tremaine decided to sit down with New York Times um, and remind them that he's black or remind us that he's black remind us of the struggles of black people and again push this narrative that he's the ultimate streetwear victim um that's what it kind of seems like now i haven't read the article i'm sure there's more to it i'm sure there's more breadth to it i'm sure i'm just only surface level kind of judging what he has to say but i feel like this whole eternal victim thing this whole narrative about supreme doing him wrong and being systemically racist i'm not gonna lie man i'm kind of tired of it I really am tired of it. And it's a shame because I feel like the guy is really talented in his own way. I feel like he has a lot to say. I feel like he's a necessary voice. I feel like his story, similar to the, um, similar to Patrick Mason, I feel like the Tremaine Emery story is something that a lot of people should use as a blueprint or as inspiration for their thing because he's not the conventional fashion designer. He's not the conventional creative director. He didn't particularly go to like an established school to learn this. And from what I know of him from afar, he's always been like a kind of sceny guy in the same way Heron Preston was, right? Sceny, communications, marketing, cool type of dude who happened to like use that and segue into kind of building a position for himself where he's a founder, CD of a very, you know, established brand and very well-liked brand in Denim Tears. He had a role obviously at, at Supreme that was really well um, you know, documented. He had a capsule collection with Virgil and Off-White that he was doing for a little while, that Art Dad's thing. And a few other bits and Bob helped out with Frank Ocean, this stuff is doozy. So he's done all these things in fashion and streetwear and menswear that he probably has no right to do, which I think is a, more of a, that should be more of an inspiration to most people out there as opposed to trying to follow in the footsteps of like a Mark Jacobs, right? Mark Jacobs is like a once in a lifetime, once, sorry, once in a generation sort of level talent. He went to all the right schools, had all the right jobs. But someone like a Tremaine like, has come from the mud. So you should be looking at this guy as like, oh shit, if he can do it, I can do it too. But when this guy talks, man, when this guy speaks, it's like, oh, come on, bro. Shut the fuck up. Like, enough with this shit. And it's weird as well because I don't remember him being like this. Like, I don't know if this is like how he always was, whether or not he was always this, he had this victim complex all the time, or if he's been sullied by the industry. Maybe he's had so many bad experiences. Maybe he's been proverbially, you know, proverbially whipped on the back so many times that now he's been kind of like scarred for life and he can't help but look at the scene with a level of contempt and shit and just keeps vocalizing it because he feels like no one else knows what's going on behind the scenes. Who knows? Regardless, I'm tired of it. Um, you know, profiting off the back of slavery and all that shit is what, what it is. But I feel like this continual, you know, blasting and rabbiting on about being a victim and being oppressed, like, bruh, you're a multimillionaire for putting cotton reefs on the fucking clothes and having a brand that, you know, isn't, you know, doing the most interesting things in the world. But still, you've been able to make a niche for yourself. You've been able to carve out a lane for yourself. You make, you make tons of cash doing it. Incredible. You sell a bunch. You inspire a bunch of people. Um, people seem to love what you do. Like, if anything, that shows you what you can do. Um, despite the things that you say are one of your things holding you back. But regardless, 
This guy likes to cry foul, likes to pretend he's a victim. So let's hear what he has to say regarding the New York Times article. So this title is Tremaine Emery refuses to hide his scars. Streetwear's black history raconteur survived Kanye supreme and the near-death experience. But can he survive the internet? That's hilarious. Survived Kanye, you know. That's fucking hilarious. But anyway, let's continue. Long after, sorry, not long after Tremaine Emery resigned his position at Supreme. We're still talking about that, by the way, right? We're still talking about Supreme. However many years on, well, a year on, maybe less than that, but you think he kind of moved on, especially after the interview he did with Angelo back, where he kind of admitted, hey, maybe I did some things wrong. Maybe it was a miscommunication. But now he's just doubling, tripling down on this supreme systemic racist. The whole world is systemically racist. I'm the most persecuted man in the world, even though I'm a multimillionaire. And yeah, whatever. Let's continue. Not long after Tremaine um, resigned the position at Supreme Credit last month, he came across an image of an old hoodie from a brand emblazoned with one of the familiar biting slogans, Illegal Business Controls America. The hoodie is part of Supreme's canon, an embodiment of the middle finger approach to appropriation, with its use of the signature Futura front lifted from Barbara Kruger and its flirtation with hip-hop radicalism. The phrase comes from the Boogie Down production song. With his fraught tenure as Supreme in rear view, it's not in rear view though, is it? He keeps fucking bringing it up. He never not he never not stops talking about fucking Supreme. It's not in his rear view. It's now part of his story. It makes him into a victim. It makes him into somebody worth talking about because maybe he thinks without the Supreme story, no one wants to hear from him, which I don't think is true. I think he has a lot of interesting things to say. But this man will not shut the fuck up about this Supreme experience. It didn't work out. It, this is what it is. It's not that deep, really. But hey, what do I know? Let's continue. He'd been hired as the first black creative director, but his tenure lasted less than a year and a half. To be fair, he was hired as the first creative director overall. The black thing is unnecessary. He was the first creative director. That's the main reason why it probably didn't work out. Because from what I led to understand, from what he said, and reading between the lines, James Jebby is still heavily involved in the day-to-day -day running of Supreme. So even though he hired a creative director who's meant to take off, he meant to take some shit off the table for him, off his plate, it seems like he still has an iron grip on what gets done there, which explains why the brand is still where it's at, right? Why it's still at the top. Because the founder who was around sweeping the fucking floors when they were stocked in Union back in the day is still there. So that probably explains a lot of it. But that also explains why it didn't work out for him. Because he's his own boss. He's got his own brand. He's now having to work an office job, basically, and have a boss who is, you know, maybe not good at delegating and whatever. That's obviously going to be a recipe for disaster. But in, in his eyes, it's because James Jebby doesn't like black people. Cool. Anyway, um, he'd been hired as his first ever black creative director, but his tenure lasted less than a year and a half. He left the company citing structural racism in his ranks. Imagine being hired as a first creative director. The first, you get hired as the first black creative director, and when you get fired, you blame it on structural racism. How does that make sense? But hey, what do I know? I'm a dumb boy. I'm a dumb boy living in my fucking parents' basement. I don't know anything. Cool. Let's continue. The, um, in part spurned on how the company um, bludgeoned a collaboration he'd secured. That word bludgeoned as well is so unnecessarily heavy. Um, bl bludgeoned a collaboration he'd secured with the firebrand artist Arthur Jaffa. By the way, don't describe me as firebrand because that just sounds like you're, you know, you're talking about somebody that's angry and black and shit. I don't, I don't like that word firebrand. Like, what? Um, Supreme, the foundational skateboard brand founded by James Jebbia, turns 30 this year, which means it's been around long enough to sow the seeds of its own resistance. I respect the legacy, said Mr. Emery. That doesn't mean I can't question it. Oh. Should we question your legacy? Should we question your legacy? Should we question your relevancy? Should we question your position? Is that allowed also, or is it only one way? God almighty, this guy. So this week, as part of his own brand, Dead in Tears, Mr. Emery is releasing a collaborative piece with Alpha Jaffa, um, where very similar to the ones that Supreme ultimately declined to release. Owing to their raw and provocative commentary on black trauma, and he remade the signature hoodie in original colors using the same visual language and a cheeky audacity, but broadcasting a different message. Systemic racism controls America. Having that emblazoned on a hoodie while also having a white wife is wild in my personal opinion. I don't fucking care about that sort of shit, right? Because I'll tackle anything that fucking moves. Don't get me wrong. But crying about systemic racism, using your brand as a platform to talk about race issues and not never not shutting up about it, but then also 
being okay with, you know, having a Nubian queen or no, having a snow bunny as a queen, not Nubian queen, is really funny. And I would honestly love somebody to ask me that question. It doesn't actually matter who you fucking sleep with or who you have as a partner. It's no one's business. But I just find that when you're in a business of like, you know, grifting on race, I find it hilarious how most people that do that are always the ones that kind of date outside their race. But anyway, who gives a fuck? Regardless, the hoodie's fucking awful. Um, I'm not having all these slogans on me anyway, even if it was Supreme. I'm not walking around with a fucking racism hoodie on me anyway. Um, but oddly enough, I checked online. The only color that's not sold out is red. And I think maybe black, maybe the gray one. The other ones are sold out. So I'm definitely in a minority. Most people love this shit. Most people love this hoodie. Um, but the funny thing about this is that I remember when this whole thing happened, when Supreme got when he got ditched by Supreme, I remember saying to myself, like, I couldn't I couldn't understand why he was so pissed off. Because in my head, I was like, when he got the job anyway, I was like, oh, sick. That'll be a chance for him to maybe do, like, not a version of Denim Tears, but to kind of uh, adjust his vision, his style, working under su Supreme. But it doesn't mean, it, it, I didn't ever think he was going to just take an idea that he would have done at Denim Tears and try and copy and paste on Supreme. It's just not going to work. I just assumed they wanted him for his taste level. They wanted him maybe for his references and shit. That would have probably made more sense. Um, but then he seemed to get annoyed that they didn't want to do ideas that probably would have fit his brand more. Like, for instance, that shirt that he allegedly wanted to do with Supreme, the one where it had the, um, what do you call it? The one where it had the flipping image of somebody getting whipped or something, right? Some slave getting whipped or something. That would have worked much better on his own brand. It's still pretty you know, hard thing to kind of stomach and see on a bit of clothing, especially when you think about most of the people that wear Supreme, or sorry, most people that wear Denim Tears aren't black, unfortunately, you'd imagine. You'd think so because, you know, to be a multi-million dollar brand, you're probably going to be selling to the majority of people and the majority of people out there aren't black and aren't the ones going to be buying your shit. I'd imagine so, but who knows? I could be wrong. But regardless, I always thought it would be a bit strange to have like, you know, these t-shirts and these things with all these incredibly charged racial images on it, worn by some like spotty white kid, you know, in, in the Lower East Side. It just didn't make any sense to me. But as an idea for your brand, cool, do it. Just do it under your own brand. So I, do, I, I never understood why this was a beef. Like Supreme turning this down makes sense because maybe it's a little bit too racially charged for them, especially now. Maybe Supreme, when they were owned primarily by James Jebby, they would have done it. But now that they are owned by this group that owns also Vans and North Face and shit, it's probably too much for them to do. Like, James J.B. also has a boss to answer to. So I didn't really see why this was such a point of contention, especially because it fits his brand so well. It's so fucking sold out already. It fits his brand incredibly well. It makes complete sense why this would be a hoodie he'd want to promote and push out there. Like, I don't see why this was an issue in the first place. Anyway, go back to the interview. It's a nod and a nudge, a wink and a slam door. The Denim Tears Jaffa collaboration, Miss Mr. Emery said, a dance between ideologies. This whole situation between me and James Chevia and the Supreme Sweet Sweet helped result in this piece of fashion art and design. Oh, bro. He's not going to start talking about it. He's going he's gonna to be talking about it. He's going to be like, this is going to be like how Jeff Staple is with a pigeon dunk, isn't it? Jeff Staple will not shut the fuck up about that shitty fucking pigeon dunk, right? And he has no other good ideas to contribute to the world so he just keeps regurgitating that one lick that he had back in the day. And I bet you the same thing that Tremaine's going to do. He's not going to shut the fuck up about Supreme until the end of time. This is going to be his thing. It's just annoying because, like, I, I, apart from, you know, unlike J Jeff Staple, who's a fucking talentless, you know, one trick pony, I honestly do think Tremaine's got great ideas and is a necessary voice and has a lot to offer. So it's just annoying that he's limiting himself to this victimhood banner. And this fucking umbrella. He's got way more to offer. It's like, bruh, just let this shit go. Please, for the love of God, let this shit go. Anyway, it continues. It's also a bristling and timely example of how Mr. Emery has, for the past few years, built upon familiar, almost taken for granted streetwear vehicles, imbuing them with layered and often unearthed meaning. In centering, amplifying black stories and perspectives are often alluded to the sect. Bruh, all this waffle just to sell fucking cotton reefs on fucking sweats and jeans is mad mad but hey let's just continue denim tears which began in 2019 as a fashion art hybrid project is a forefront of a wonderful rising post-supreme streetwear concerns uh awake 
and why barriers born and raised among them not only are prey by white people. What? What? Ah! Oh! Now we're trying to say that what? Fucking streetwear has mostly been a white man. Like what? Streetwear's been the one... Streetwear's been the great equalizer. Most of the great menswear designers, Virgil Abloh included, R.I.P. to the dead, came from streetwear because streetwear allowed any person with an idea to put an idea on a t-shirt and have it on the same rack as a fucking Bottega one. That's what streetwear is. That's why it's so fucking cool because it's what people actually wear on the fucking street. And you can get your ideas out on some easily, readily available fucking silhouettes, whether it's a t-shirt, a hoodie, a beanie, a cap, a pair of jeans, and everybody can wear that shit, and you can have your shit on the same level as some of the high fashion brands out there. That's what makes it amazing. Level playing field for all. All. Whether you're black, white, whatever, fat, small, one hand, one eye, no one fucking cares. You got good ideas, you got cool bits, you got some nice pieces, we're gonna buy it. We might even queue outside your store to fucking buy it. Making this into like, Street Air was this dominated by white it's like what are you talking about bro like what are you talking about have you seen what cues look like from the beginning of the dawn of fucking cues outside the stores from sneakers they're, they're, they're a fucking smorgasbord of people from all walks of life fucking hell bro like what the fuck is this anyway let's continue not only operated by white people it's also been able to scale quickly thanks to collaborators. Uh, it, it's, it was just funny, right? You don't, you don't like whites, but you collaborate with Levi's. Okay, wh whatever. Whatever. It, 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 it's good. It's been able to scale quickly thanks to collaboration with Levi's Converse, Our Legacy, Dior, uh, its Pan-African flag tweets on Ralph Lauren designs. The most, what, especially Our Legacy, you couldn't get a more Caucasian brand than Scandinavian-based Our Legacy, right? Like, no one else wears that kitschy, patchworky, geography teacher shit than white people. And here you are complaining about them. God almighty, man. God almighty. Uh, let's continue. But it remains a nimble business with a different approach to commercial risk than the more established brands that have turned streetwear into a multi-billion dollar industry and which often strategically utilize black expression as an accent of course. Ah! Being a key part of this generational change in streetwear has put Mr. Emery in the crosshairs of almost every turn. Nah, he's been the crosshairs because he just talks some absolute waffle at times. It's annoying, bro. He's way smarter than this. I'd hope he is anyway. It's like, come on, man. You're just waffling out here. Waffling. Mr. Emery, the crosshairs of almost every turn as a symbol of both transformation and representation. As Supreme, he found an insufficiently diverse staff who treat discourse about... <laughs> Can you imagine working at Supreme all these years, right? Having a blast, being at this place. Dream job for some people. And then Tremaine Emery comes, works on his first day, and he's like, yeah, so about George Floyd. It's like, bro, I'm just trying to eat my fucking burrito while I fucking quickly sort out this fucking, you know, this deck. While I quickly sort out this tech pack. Like, come on, man. Like, forget scaring all the hoes. You're scaring all the designers away. Like, wow, go on, relax. They didn't want to, um, what you call it? Uh, As Supreme, found an insufficiently diverse staff who treat discourse about race like pushing food around the plate. They didn't want to eat the vegetables. So what, we're vegetables now? What? What are we, okra? Cool. The Jaffa images he'd wanted to put on Supreme clothes and skateboards, which included depictions of lynching and the <laughs> lash marks on the back of a former slave caused discomfort internally and externally. You don't say. You don't say, bro. You don't say. Shock horror. Supreme didn't want depictions of lynching and lash marks on the back of former slaves on their fucking crisp white t-shirts that they're going to sell to fucking kids that have fucking trust funds and are more white than fucking Justin Bieber. Are you fucking sure? I am shocked. I am shocked. I'm shocked. I really am shocked. Anyway, and while leaving Supreme freed Mr. Emery to devote all his work time to Denim Tears, his current food culture, sorry, uh, his current collection, which had originally from Black Southern Food, he has been met with some online resistance. Cool. There's him with a great Virgil. RIP to the fucking great. Let's continue. All the while, he's been recovering from an October 
2022 erotic aneurysm that landed him in hospital for two and a half months. Okay, cool. We know about that. Um, he was being attacked on social media by Ye. Attacked by so honestly, man. This guy, imagine, imagine, imagine being so happy that you're a victim, like boldly proclaiming that you're a victim and what that Ye bullied you or something. Like, come on, man. Come on. Come on. For daring to publicly denounce his White Lives Matter era antics. For Mr. Emery, whose natural disposition tends to be uh, ruminative and patient, and who from much of 2010s played creative consorts for West and Frank Ocean, among others, while coming into his own clothing designer following the path laid out by his close friend, Virgil Abloh, detention has been dizzying and disorientating, though not de-establishing. Um, de -establishing. You know what's really odd about this Yay thing? A lot of people have said this whole Kanye loving Trump Loving Hitler, um, hating Jews, hasn't been new. People that have been near and close to him have been saying from, I forgot what album was it? I think they might have said Jesus. From Jesus' era, and I think that was around the time that um, Tremaine was working with him, he's been saying these things behind the scenes. We already saw flirtations of it. Yeah, it was always already going to crack and go over that side when he started wearing Confederate flags on his jackets and shit, right? He was kind of testing the waters. But allegedly, he'd been saying... Hitler shit from time. I think the rumor was that he wanted to call Jesus Hitler, I think, at the, at, at the time, or something on those kind of lines, right? So I find it funny that, you know, you're trying to, like, proclaim that you were some sort of, like, what do you call it, freedom fighter, or you should be heralded as some sort of brave person because you denounced Ye saying white lives matter, when most likely he was getting up to all sorts of manners behind the scenes that you never called out back then because it was advantageous to be part of his crew, to get the free Yeezys, to be going to all the listening parties, to be walking around with him, going to the studio. Everyone liked to be clouded up. But the moment he went too far, it started to hurt their money. They're all kind of backed away. But from what I've read, again, who knows if it's true, he's been building up to this moment. He'd been uttering certain things that would lead you to believe that, you know, he's going to go off in the deep end. And now these guys are trying to act as if like, you know, there's some freedom fires because they they said the thing at the end when it was up, when it was easy to say. But in the midst of you having a fun time and getting fat invoices paid and shit and free shoes, no one said anything. Everyone was posting their box of shoes. Thank you, Team Yeezy. Thank you, Yay. And now all of a sudden, you don't want to be his friend anymore. All right, cool. Let's continue. The purgatory, because you can't do what you want to do as a black man in America. <laughs> Tremaine's so full of shit. It's purgatory because you can't do what you want to do. So what are you doing then? You've made millions from selling hoodies and t-shirts. Isn't that the opposite of what you're saying? You haven't created, you haven't invented something. You haven't, you know, uh, spearheaded a new service that you've done. Nothing substantial to really help humanity. But somehow you've become a millionaire from screen printing on sweats and tees. That is the antithesis of being able to do exactly what you want as a black man in America, despite the hurdles. That should show you that anything is actually possible if you put your mind to it. Yes, there's race issues in, in America. We all know it. Even around the world, we've all got our fucking issues. But if you can make it, especially, again, not to be mean, not to be mean, not to be mean, but if you can make it looking like Tremaine, anybody can make it. The fact that he made it without any real education, any real schooling, any real training, and just learning on the job, and being the right people, and blah, 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 is proof that you can do it despite the hurdles, despite the blocks put in front of you. But now, somehow, this guy that makes millions off of stuff like this is crying about, you can't do things. What, what's, the, what's the sentence? What's the, what's the fucking sentence? Where is it? Uh, it's purgatory. Because you can't do what you want to do as a black man in America. Okay. You couldn't do what you wanted to do as Supreme. You left or got fired. Then you went back to your own brand, which some people, again, I wouldn't say this because I think Supreme is the greatest streetwear brand of all time. But I think there's some people out there who are big Denim Tears fans. They might as go as far as saying Supreme is, Denim Tears is better than Supreme. So you left a brand that some people rate as the best brand in the world, you then went back to your own brand that loads of people fucking love and adore, then you did exactly what you wanted to do, but here you are complaining that black men can't do what they want to do when you just did it. 
Make that make sense. He said in early March of his tugs of war about who can steer black storytelling in fashion and to where. You're working with the confines of what white culture at large wants you to do. Also, what black culture at large, especially to. I'd love to hear from fucking Tremaine's wife. It must be so weird to be in a relationship with somebody who hates your race but loves you. How does that work then? He's complaining about the white man, but your daddy's white, your mama's white. You know, you came up in a whatever right hierarchy, blah, blah, whatever, right? Like, how does that work then? You're always complaining about these things, but then you're going to probably have kids that are going to have mixed heritage. Like, how, how does this work? How does this work? Is it helping you? Is it hindering you? Choose a fight. Choose a villain. Choose a struggle. You can't have all of them. I don't think anyway. Let's continue. Rather than shy away from the hard questions, though, Mr. Emery is leaning in. He was speaking at the Steel Spartan Denim Tears office in West Broadway, Manhattan, around the corner from his first permanent retail space, African Diaspora Goods. Man's got his own studio. Man's got his own fucking store. Maybe a couple of houses. Probably a nice whip. Covered himself healthcare when he had that crazy aneurysm. Thank God he got well. And he's saying it's impossible for a black man to do what he wants. And he came from being what? The cool guy on the scene. No real training. Was never really seen as a, as a designer. All of a sudden, boom, he's blown up and become one of the most important brands existing nowadays in the streetwear kind of menswear space. But allegedly, you can't do what you want to do as a black man. All right, cool, bro. And his brand is predominantly shit about the black experience. God almighty. Sometimes, I've, I don't know. My brain hurts sometimes. Which sells his brand alongside a collection of 2,000 African art history books, which will eventually function as a kind of non-lending research library. Denim Tears is currently the best known for its cotton reef motif that Mr. Emery began applying to vintage Levi's jeans in 2020. Originally as a limited release that felt more like an artistic than Satori intervention, subsequently much more widely on the jeans and caps and sweatshirts. The goal was um, dis disco discurvice, sorry. The, the goal was discurvice to highlight the product of slave labor and make it a manifest on the product itself. In the last year, especially, the reef has become one of the most recognizable, ubiquitous, now widely bootleg logos in streetwear. And you know what's funny about that fucking logo? You know what's hilarious about that fucking logo? <laughs> You're now seeing loads of people wearing it who have no idea what it represents. No idea the significance of it. No idea the weight of it. No idea the brevity of it. No idea the impact of it. It's wearing it because it's a cool thing. And on top of it, it makes it hilarious. I saw a video of this kid who's, a, I guess, a, a fan of Israel, right? Some would refer to as a Zionist, screaming epiphas and slurs at, at pro-Palestinian protesters wearing a denim tears hoodie, which it, to me is like, you know, quintessential the times we're living in at the moment. This guy has this brand where he's trying to, you know, platform it as a voice for the voiceless and a chance to share the black experience and essentially using trauma as a fucking, you know, as a theme for his designs and trying to speak for the people that have been downtrodden and oppressed. And then you've got a person who is one of the oppressors, figuratively speaking, wearing the hoodie screaming at somebody that he probably should be aligning themselves with. It's just, I don't know. You can't make this shit up. You can't make it up. It's fucking incredible. Anyway, he says, that means that this course spreads, Mr. Emery. Part of Mr. Emery's influence and power comes from now how he brings these references points into, into quote, as I say, quotidian, quotidian. Um, easy to wear garments like jeans, hoodies, and t-shirts. It's beautifully utilitarian approach, said the fashion designer, Andre Walker, a close friend of, uh, of Miss Emery. Cool. Big up Andre Walker. Absolute legend. The title of the current m collection is Kiss My Grits. What his mother and many others in the South used to say as a proxy to kick my black ass. Black food references Fred, the collection together across a desperate design frameworks. The clothes include ab abstraction, a silk velour shirt and pants in colors of the spices used to make fried chicken and pop <laughs> Yo, this nigga selling fried chicken Chicken shirts. I fucking love this guy, man. Anyway, colors of spices used to make fried chicken, pop out watermelon, 
green rind on the outside and red and seed um, filled meat on the inside made with Comme des Garçons, the best thing he's ever done, and a baroque painting, a hoodie with the still life of various fruits. There are shirts done in picnic cable top cloth patterns and necklaces made of chicken bones and sealed in resin. I'm surprised he didn't do a flip of the Burberry print. You know the babe, you know the babe, you know the Burberry print uh, baby daddy shirt that all black people wear. I'm surprised he didn't do that as another thing. Like you know, if, if you if you're gonna go down that you know black iconography, just make a shirt with fucking with a with a milk crate challenge on it. You know what I mean? Do that or a shirt with fucking braids on the front. You know, we were kangs. Fucking hell. Anyway, low low hanging fruit, reductive and just lame. But again, what do I know? Um. Mr. Emery wants use of the imagery, walks a beautiful tightrope and subtly of the ob obviousness as Mr. Walker. He signifies are drawn directly from Mr. Emery's upbringing, spending summers in rural Harlem, Georgia. The breakfast table at the mother's hotel. Okay, we care about that. Um, that's who I came from, he said. You know what I mean? So I don't feel shame about no watermelon. <laughs> watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I fucking love him. Um, it's part of my watermelon. It's part of my culture. Ah, uh, the black black culture is fried chicken and watermelons. Oh my god, bro! I swear to God, if somebody said my culture is fucking okra and black, I, I'm I'm angry. I'm fighting you. Don't fucking reduce me to foods, you piece of shit. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> The same type of white folk that burnt down Tulsa. They turned into... <laughs> uh, oh, oh. I want to be there when Tremaine does and his wife does a fucking 23, 23 and me and realizes that her parents were maybe owned a fucking plantation or something. That would be fucking hilarious. Imagine if that happened. His wife found out that her family were like former slave owners or they were responsible for burning down Tulsa and shit. Oh, God. Imagine the heartbreak. Imagine. Um, and I'm not going for that, he says. There you go. We've got some images there of a watermelon um, sweatshirt and a tablecloth jean jacket. We've also got a chicken bone necklaces. And again, T-shirt. The chicken bones are made into a necklace. They reference bone throwing um, deviation rituals and also refer to how young Mr. Abler would watch his father crack bones and suck out the marrow. It's also a nod to Vivian Westwood and Leonard Rock Boutique, which sold clothes with chicken bones. So, um, it looks a bit jujuist to me. I'm not going to lie. I'm sure it's got a lot of references, you know, that they've kind of pulled out of their asses retrospectively, but it just looks a bit too much juju look to me, isn't it? I'm not into that. I'm not into the juju. I'm not into the voodoo. So for me, it's I'm out on that one, to be completely honest. Not for me. Um, for Mr. Emery, though, the clothes are part of a long pattern of embedding personal narratives into his design. The dusty red on the Asics collaboration he released in 2021 referred to the clay of Mr. Emery's family funeral plot in Georgia. One of his earliest t-shirts was sold at pop-ups in New York, probably featured a photo of his mother who died in 2015. Um, at this time, Sorry, this time around, however, some of his online chatter from the black critics has been unsparing. Part of why it's polarizing is because people don't see me as an artist. Oh, God almighty, bro. We just don't get him, man. This is probably his experience from Ye. He's doing that defensive, like, we just don't understand. No, we understand. We just think of shit. Bro. Part of, the, part of why it's polarizing is because people don't see me as an artist. All right, bro. Mr. Emery said he sees his collection, his clothing, so as a tradition that includes David Hammond's, he, uh, again, another person he doesn't shut the fuck up about. Um, David Hammond's wouldn't do something as lame as shit, as lame as this. I don't think so. 1970s artworks that use spades, Kate Carver Walker's um, A Subtlety, and a Sphinx X installation of the Domino um, Sugar Factory in 2014, and Spike Lee's film Bamboozled. Great references. It's a shame that all these references just result in this shit, isn't it, right? All those amazing references just result in a, sh in a hoodie like that. Huh. Um, if people think I'm I'm on some step... What's that? Stephen Fittich Black Sambo. You're really not paying attention. Step in, fetch in Black Sambo. You're not paying attention. We just don't get it, right? We just don't... Okay, cool. I'm making a pawn a king. What? All right. Mr. Emery refers to these online critics as the loud minority. 
<laughs> I think they're the majority. Let's go to his actually Instagram. Let's see his fucking Instagram. I think they're the majority, brother. I'm not gonna lie. I think these people are the fucking majority, myself included. Let's see what. Let's see what the. Let's see what the actual people them are saying about some of this shit this guy's trying to pedal. Let's see, because he put the article up on his page. Let's see what they're actually saying in the comments. Big up Tremaine anyway for not deleting the comments. He does let people talk and converse and debate. So let's see. Oh, look at this. Is actually this is hilarious too. Tremaine has. This is this is what I love about this guy, right? He's so sometimes as much as I love the guy, he's so full of shit. So Tremaine's up here, you know, voice of the voiceless, doesn't stop talking about social issues, very politically charged, always talking about, you know, um, always speaking truth to power, always speaking against abuse. But here he is in this current post I got on the screen, promoting something he's doing with Tom Sachs. Now, again, I love Tom Sachs. I love the Mars Yards. I love the studio. I love everything that he does. I still think he got cancelled unjustifiably. I don't think it's a crime to be a cunt. But if you're this, everybody's a victim, speaking up for the voiceless type of person. If you're on this believe all women type of shit, it's a bit weird for you to then be okay with somebody that was accused of abusing his staff and doing like weird sexually inappropriate shit, turning up to meetings in his underwear and all that sort of malarkey, calling people's names, throwing, you know, moleskins at their heads and shit. Don't you find that a bit odd to be the person that's like against, you know, structural abuse and powers and systems and shit, but then you're also championing a guy who was alleged to be abusing the power and influence that he had on his employees. Don't you find that utterly hypocritical? I do. Maybe I'm in the minority. But again, what do I know? Let's go back to the fucking comments. Oh, 219 comments. Let's see. Let's see what people say here. Um, let's see. What people, let's see. Um, two comments already like here. Let's see what, what Dash people are saying. Is the Rubik's Cube going to release with multi product trying to copy it to a whisk kid son? <laughs> of course, there's a white man wanting to cop that fucking racism. A fucking, um, yeah, Rubik's Cube. You've got to love that. What people are saying here? Uh, I mean, I can't even let the Supreme... I mean, can't even let the Supreme thing go. Excited for this. Another one says, LMO, survive the internet. Survive Kanye. Grow a pair. There are people living in literal war zones and hell. Exactly. Thank you. Finally, somebody has said the thing that I've been trying to say in a very long-winded way. There are people lit literally living in war zones and here's this guy crying about Kanye making a shitty brand called Tremendous that he was going to put out there um, that obviously didn't see the light of day, luckily, because it was fucking terrible. And he is comparing it to the struggle of them people. Obviously, that girl, Gabrielle, is also involved. She might be the reason why everything started like that, you know? She was the person that first criticized Kanye's um, White Lives Matter shirt, right? So big up her. Um, or who else? Let's see what else people are saying here. Unstoppable. Survived Kanye. Supreme and a near-death experience. What next? You survived Diddy too. <laughs> Big up this person. You can survive it all. Yes, sir. Survived Kanye, question mark. Survived Diddy too. Let's see what other comment people are saying here. So it's not the, again, it's not the minority. I think it's 50-50, mate. I'm not going to lie. Tell me you can't handle Insta comments. Who telling me? Good job. This angle getting old now. Just cop the red. OE. You got this forever in your corner. Of course, another white person. Um, done copying Supreme yes this person says man what we doing Tremaine can't wait till I run into you fuck the money I want to do it okay this person's sucking dick oh that's so dub bro we don't want imagine oh, imagine that if you really want to be pro black that's what you need to do you need to do a Desto dub awful old cough syrup denim tears collaboration chicken and waffles with a bit of lean on the side that's the real black experience that's a real black expression. <laughs> um, it's not about the controversy. Please make about design again. Yeah, the survive the Kanye part is not it. Your gas, your glitching. I don't know what that is. What's glitching? Um, you're, you are one of my biggest inspiration, but stop being a victim. Be the pan-Africanist that you are claiming to be and act like a man. Stop gentrifying at, stop gentrifying, stop, your gentrification aesthetic, shit, we a new world right now. Exactly. Exactly, bro. Tell the guy to grow a pair. Get over it, bro. We all had fucking, we all probably got our dream. All of us have had experiences where we got a job that we dreamed of and it hasn't been what we dreamed of. You know, it happens sometimes. It can be annoying. It can be frustrating. But let it go, bro. Let it go. 
Surviving Kanye is such a reach. Oh my God, these clicks merchants are so lame. S SEO wanksers. The real you. Yes, you can. Um, they wasn't there. Big love T. Of course, Tremaine Emery can. God bless Tremaine. Tremaine can. He can Emery. We get through anything. Sigh, grown men here getting emotional. Dude, you're a fantastic creative. Let your work speak. Did y'all even read the article? Because this headline is misleading. No, it's not really. Um, I love people say that. Oh, it took me out of context. Nah, the article is all the context we need. You know, and also you don't get to like, what do you want me to do? More research to find out exactly what you mean. You don't like, you, <laughs> as if you're owed that. What you say, what we see is what we see. Like, so it is what it is. Um, Survive Kanye can't be one of the things mentioned. <laughs> he's a victim because he's black. Great statements and work is so strong. Okay, cool. So 50-50, I think. Let's continue. Um, Mr. Emery refers to his online Chris as a loud minority. If it was a loud majority, I wouldn't be sitting here. Oh, that's, but that's a problem, though. He's not understanding. The majority of people like what he does, clearly. But, you know, which is our, it's debatable because I think, you know, we all try to look for our 1,000 true fans. And I think 1,000 true fans will probably be able to sustain you and, you know, keep the lights on in your house and whatnot and let you pay the bills because they're your true fans and they'll pay and buy anything that you do. Cool. But most people have an issue when he talks about all this shit because he's usually talking out of his ass. Let's see what he says about here. Um, if it was Lama George, I wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't be able to pay my staff. I wouldn't be able to open a store. I wouldn't be able to pay my expenses and her, uh, my expensive vast health insurance. But that's the thing, though. You're doing really well, but then you're complaining about structural racism. It's like you're the, you're the obvious example that the structural racism you speak about isn't as bad as you make it to seem as because you made it despite maybe not being as talented as others, but by using your connections, your grit, your determination, all this sort of shit to get to where you want to get to. That is proof that you can make it in spite of what you are faced with obstacle-wise. But this guy doesn't want to admit that for some reason because also it's more beneficial to be a victim because his whole fucking platform, his whole brand is built on being a fucking victim, basically. Victimhood sells, isn't it? Victim book, victimhood is um, very profitable for this guy. Um, he's also been attacked for marrying a white woman. Let's see what he says about this. Interesting. I've been made final for dating black girl Oh, here we go. <laughs> this guy. Oy. I've been made fun of for dating a black girl with natural hair. And I've lived enough to make me fun of for marrying a white woman. I've seen both sides. He noted with a rare flash of exasperation. James Baldwin dated white men and he's the most prolific, most... Oh, no, 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 no. Don't get other people involved. Personally, for me, I could give one shit who you sleep with. I could give one shit who you marry. I could give one shit who you have kids with. I could give one shit who you spend your whole life with. But if you're going to sit there and grift and use racial issues and racism and all this malarkey as a fucking, as a, as a Trojan horse for your, you know, for your capitalism, and then you're going to turn around and pretend like you marrying a white person isn't weird or funny, that's when I have a problem with you. I don't care what you do, but you're out here rabbing on about racism, 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 Supreme is racist, but then allegedly you met this woman at Supreme. So this racist company that gave you hell, that ruined your life, that, you know, maybe in some walks, maybe in some people's eyes might have been the cause of the health issues you had or that stress you were going through. Why would you then be happy to take somebody from that environment and make them your life partner? Wouldn't you want to complete this is from it? You'd be like, you know what? I don't want anything to do with this. But now, she was good enough. So what? Was she the only white person that was good? So there's only one white person that you like in the world that was okay? That one lady? Or are you just full of shit? Which one is it? Come on, bro. And again, like, I've got shit. Like, who, who made fun? Like, again, who made fun of you at dating a girl with natural hair? That's fucking a lie, man. A lie, a lie, a lie, a lie. But especially in streetwear, where most of the guys in streetwear fucking love Asian women. Especially back in the day when I was coming up, like everybody wanted to fucking be with some Japanese girl or something because I thought they thought like they they dressed well. I don't know, it's fucking insane. But regardless, oh this guy, man, sometimes. <sighs> 
Andy Emery McConnell. <laughs> of course, you double barreled the name. Of course, of course, of course. Anyway, <laughs> Andy Emery McConnell, who Emery, <laughs> who Emery married in October, has watched him navigate the, crit- the critiques up close. It's, it's his soul coming out into the form of the pieces that he chose to put out. Oh, she's full of shit too. What? It's his soul coming out into the form of the pieces that he chooses to put out into the public. And when someone comes for your soul, how can you... Oh, shut up! Oh, with all due respect, man, what are you talking about, bro? This is soul. This is soul work. He's having to tap into his fucking deep soul for this shit. Is that what we're saying? Come on, man. Everyone give their head a wobble. Everyone relax. Everyone take a deep breath. Please. God damn it. The road to recovery. Much of the conversation about Mr. Emery and his work mirrors the discourse about Mr. Abloh. Let's not compare Tremaine to Virgil. Please, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Altern- um, alternately dragged um, and praised sometimes by the same people. Let's not do this. <sighs> in the final years before his death in 2021, Ms. Abloh was the most visible black designer in men's fashion. His success... Op- but have you noticed that Virgil never did all this shit? Even though Virgil did get a lot of stick mostly based on what he looked like and his background and who he was friends with. Don't you, did, don't you realize, or did, can you not remember that he didn't once try and use it as an excuse? He recognized it. He may have spoke about it, but he didn't lean into being a victim. He just kept on keeping on. Despite all the naysayers, despite all the people, and, and even in Virgil's case, Everybody that kind of criticized him were the ones that were first running to kind of give their condolences and well wishes and regards when he passed, right? The ones that were kind of the ones that were the most vocal critics were the ones that had so much to say when he ended up passing. Like, Get fucked. Miss Abloh was the most visible. Um, his success opened doors to many young generation, but the persistent and often uh, personality meta narrative about his work was draining. That Emery is experiencing similar pushback during a period of time where he's still navigating his uh, medical recovery, much as <laughs> Abloh to see. <laughs> ah, this guy. Have sympathy for me because I'm sick. Sympathy for me because I'm black. Sympathy for me, have sympathy for me because I'm married white. Sympathy for me because Supreme fired me. Yo, this guy's a professional victim. This is like, he's like Amanda Seals. Tremaine is basically male Amanda Seals. He loves being a fucking victim and he doesn't know why everyone hates him or not even hates him, doesn't like the things that he says or pushes back. Like, it's like, bruh. He was hospitalized for the erotic this, this section eight months into his time at Supreme, a near death experience that led to two induced comas and a fasciotomy on his left leg, pneumonia, blood um, sepsis, kidney failure, and dialysis. If this happened to me at a job, I'm shutting up about it. I think there's just too much juju. Too much bad vibe. I'm just not going to talk about it anymore. If this happened to me at a job, I'm shutting up about it. If this brought me this much strife, this much pain, this much anguish, all in a span of just a few weeks. Mitch, I've visited the hospital. I said it's not your time. You're supposed to be here. We are not supposed to lose you the way we lost Virgil. We got more than we got more than that you're supposed to do. We got more that you're supposed to do. Um, when Mr. Emery got home from the hospital, he couldn't sleep with covers on because the nerves of his legs were too sensitive. He left hospital with a wheelchair, eventually graduated to a walker, and now walks slowly and deliberately, aided by a hiking stick. Ugh, Jesus Christ, us, bro. My, my guy can barely walk and he's still crying about Supreme. Like, surely your energy should be on different things, but what do I know? For shoes, he wears only hawkers. Apart from the rare night out, three times a week in the sleek, minimalist boot filled Tribeca loft, Mr. McConnell and him, Mr. McConnell, share his physical therapist arrives for a private session. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to expect a collaboration with him and Hocker soon, right? I'm assuming this is why they mentioned it. I'm assuming there's some sort of Hocker collaboration happening um, with Denim Tears. That's like, that'd be funny, isn't it, right? Um, <laughs> Anti racism walking shoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking hell anti-racism creepers bro like fuck me bro oh um not all the hurt is physical though mr abler's passing um left the talent vacuum because certain people certain other people aren't here miss emery said the target is on my back disgusting using virgil's passing as an excuse for why you're getting 
pushback and abuse online is insane when it's pretty clear why you're getting it and it isn't even that deep <laughs> you know most people like what you do you said it already that's why you got a successful brand that's why you're multi million that's why you got staff that's why you got a store but sometimes some of this shit you say is bullshit people try and call you out for it and now you're saying you're only getting this because Virgil passed and you're the only like what <sighs> Mr. Emery's close relationship with Mr. Ablo informed his development as a clothing designer. V is the first person in my adult life who was like, you're an artist. When Mr. Ablo, when Mr. Emery first showed him the images of his reefs, he said, this is beautiful. Six months, you're going to have a Maybach. Which is true. Um, so big up Virgil for seeing the vision. Um, <sighs> Mr. Emery laughed a little bit, so I'm making good. I didn't buy the Maybach. I did this store. The store opened last month in the old Union space in Spring Street. Again, good heritage. Look again the Supreme connection there. The old Union space happened to be the old Supreme store. If you know, you know. Well, it, it, that was a place where James Jebbia first kind of got started doing his thing. So that legacy is there deep. Imagine, and yeah, anyway, whatever. I'm not going to get into all that stuff. One of the foundational addresses in New York streetwear history in a rich coincidence, Mr. Jebby was a fan of Union. Exactly. The space was wholly redesigned by the artist Fiesta, uh, Fiesta Gates and updated on the design he'd first displayed in 2019 submission called Region Projects. And Mr. Abloh preparation for the collaboration with Mr. Ablo on the possible store. There you got the store there with the shit in there. Cool. Um, on the right wall made a torch plywood over steel frame. Our denim tears clothes hanging from the face out lengths of the pipe. On the left wall, the African art collection with Mish Emery bought for 150 from the Alka bookstore. A site of black possibility for the gates called the store. We didn't have the burden of the whole space being a retail store. It was like, what if people came in and they were a little bit confused about what was happening here? That's pretty cool. So it's half store, half gallery, half information center, half rad radicalization zone, right? Cool. We love it. Productive confusion is Mr. Emery's meter. Um, both his falling out with Supreme and the recent Denim Tears blowback turn into part on how the black experience could should be captured on clothing, especially clothing that may be brought up and worn and displayed on the world by people who haven't lived that experience. Or, as one TikToker put it, can white people wear Denim Tears? For the record, Mr. Emery's answer is yes. If I see a little white kid wearing it, I'm like, fire. I wonder what the conversation is up in his crib. There is no conversation. People don't give a fuck about the meaning of the clothes. They just wear it because it's cool. Anyway, maybe the conversation is beautiful and the dad's like, where do you get the shirt? Can we look it up? Or perhaps it goes another equally revealing way. Maybe the kid gets into an argument and realizes that even though he loves his dad, his dad's a racist. <laughs> this guy is insane. This guy is insane, bro. Tremaine's insane. <laughs> Who the fuck is he speaking? <laughs> He's that to exist. I don't think it goes that way. Anyway, I don't know. What do I know? And maybe the kid's like, I never want to be like this part of him. And maybe that happened because of that conversation about a t shirt. Yo, the man, this guy thinks a lot of himself, isn't it? I, you gotta have this kind of confidence, but this is insane. To think your conversations are driving racial or spearheading racial conversations around the dinner table is fucking hilarious number one even thinking that that kid is that speaks to him anyway or vice versa is fucking hilarious oh i love it there were some mr emery's crucial questions um is there a distinction between a gallery and a t-shirt this is the questions this nigga is ruminating over is there a distinction between a gallery and a t-shirt? <sighs> How vast is the chasm between style and art? Are some images too unsettling to put on clothes? Should images that are, are so unsettling be looked at even... Okay, cool, man. Cool. cool. Whatever. Um, a desire for discourse about the past and present. I think the reality is Tremaine Dry craves discourse, said Anthony Spector, Mr. Emery's close friend of more than a decade and business partner in tears. Tremaine's exit from Supreme, a lot of that revolved around the fact that there was no discourse. It wasn't, yeah, but you're, you're at a job, bro. Shut the fuck up and stop talking. Do the fucking job. It's basically an office. It was never going to work anyway because he's basically an entrepreneur going back and working an office job. That's going to be hard. Doing a nine to five while also running your own brand is going to be difficult or running a business. That's why it didn't work out. 
But this course, like, why is everything about fucking talking and feelings? I like, just do the fucking job or not. Choice Expert Supreme had a lot revolved around the fact that there was no discourse. It wasn't about someone attacking his idea. Well, he he said it was about that, didn't he? The most successful part of him, the most stressful part for him, the part that made him realize he couldn't do the job was that he wasn't able to talk about it. Oh, all right, cool. Whatever you say. Mr. Emery received a Supreme offer the week uh, of Mr. Abloh's death and began the job in February 2022. Mr. Abloh, he said, had warned him not to take it. He said, what would it take for you to culturally move that brand? Do you really want to extend that energy? And boy, will my brother write again. You see, you didn't listen. You wanted the clout. You wanted the money. You wanted the notoriety, the prestige of the job. You got in, realized it's just a regular office job. You realized it wasn't as nice as you thought it would be. And then you started to cry racism. When it wasn't really racism, it just wasn't a good fit. It happens. Get over it. Fuck. Mr. Emery had long been in a social orbit of Supreme, a now big company acquired by VF Corporation in 2020 for more than $2 billion that still functions like a private party. His tenure there lasted only 13 months, not counting the five and a half months he was on medical leave. Oof. That probably put a strain on it as well, didn't it, right? Being on medical leave for five and a half months. It shouldn't, but you know how companies are. You know how companies are. Uh, continuing, despite having hired Mr. Emery as creative director, the first time the insular company had hired someone with that title, Mr. Jebby had remained a hoovering, um, a hovering presence. Um, what do you call it? Mr. Emery said not long before Mr. Emery's supposition, he and Mr. Jebby had a face off in a meeting over control. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, but this guy just started like he's got he's got the mindset of a Gen Z, isn't it? He's just started going into fashion and he's already here complaining about this sort of stuff. It's like, come on, man enough um i had to really put my foot down with james <laughs> we miss emery record i said are we are we musha and raf because i wasn't hired under that pretext i was hired as your step as you were stepping back musha and prada hired us <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> imagine james jebby's face seeing this guy who just got started Telling him, like, I had to do his job. I had to run his company. Who's Musha? Who's Raf? Am I Raf or are you Musha? Oh, this guy's a fucking legend. Um, Free representative Supreme declined to comment. Of course, man. Let's not allow this. In creative meetings, Mr. Emery would sometimes be told a project he suggested would be done at the tears was admirable, but wouldn't work as Supreme. True. But Supreme was has deployed the, the patina of black radicalization previously whether images of Martin Luther King or Black Hand extending a middle finger on a t-shirt or the collaboration with hip-hop duo Dead Presidents. Um, it has featured up teen rappers on shirts and played the imagery far less radical like the presidential headshot of Barack Obama. It has also showcased progressive art like Andre Seriano's Piss Christ. But that's the thing that makes him look way worse. This could have been a great job not only just to do what you do at Dead in Tears, but to do like a different version of it, not just take literal ideas. Maybe try and, what you call it? Maybe try and dumb down, maybe try and water down the racially highly charged stuff that you would do at Dead in Tears and get away with and try and apply that to Supreme. Because that's actually an interesting design challenge. Hey, how can I get these really intense things to come across um, to normy generic public people? That's actually an interesting design challenge. I'd love to approach that some way. Do you know what I mean? That's actually a cooler way to actually test your design chops, your artistic merit, your ideas, how creatively you think, how broadly you think. That's actually a great, you know, because you can, everyone could do whatever they want on their, own, on their own label. But when you have some constraints, budget, you know, whatever, structural, whatever it may be, you have notes, that's when you really kind of test whether or not you can actually present them in a good way and kind of get approved for people who probably don't want to approve shit. But anyway, what do I know? But Mr. Emery found these engagements to be surface level. If the staff was unable to truly talk about the complexities of the black life and the culture, then why are we touching it at all? Mr. Emery realized he hadn't been brought in to change an agent. He recorded a meeting about whether to release a shirt featuring the controversial young rap artist called Young, young Boy Never Broke Again, in which concerns about his criminal history were being weighed against his popularity on streaming services among young people. The project was approved. Mr. Emery recalls Mr. Jaffa saying, does James listen to NBA Youngboy? <laughs> Mr. Emery continued, he wasn't trolling James. 
what he was saying is if you listen to it the lyrics are dark the darkness isn't far removed from how dark my work is that's what aj was saying like do they not see if you could do it and be a young boy you can do me that's not the se- oh my god Having a picture of NBA Youngboy in a t-shirt isn't the same thing as having an image of a slave being whipped on the back. I'm sorry. It just isn't. It's just not isn't. It just isn't. Mr. Chapo has been one of Emery's first calls when he arrived at Supreme. When Mr. Emery was still working at, for Mr. West, he'd brokered a meeting with Mr. Jaffa, who used Mr. West's music in a breakout 2016 music. Love is a message. The message is my death. For Supreme... They plan to collaborate on items using more than Miss Jaffa's rawest imagery, including La Rage, featuring a Hulk S character depicted in hyperbolized um, cartoon art in underscore black frustration, the ex slave Gordon, an image of the free black man showing the scars of whippings he suffered while in bondage. People always think you're a black artist, that your stuff is supposed to be in some ways relatable or palatable. I call it after school special. I do what I want to do. I'm not interested in white folks telling me what to do, but neither am I interested in black people telling me what to do. But that's the thing, though. Would Arthur Jaffa have taken a job at Supreme? Obviously not. He would have known Wild Guan and not even taken a job. He'd prefer to do his own thing. So it's like they're both coming from different points. And, you know, it's just funny that this is the guy that he kind of runs to when, you know, he will probably know that Supreme would have never approved this anyway. But hey, what can I do? So here's the, some of the images. Again, this works very well with fucking Denim Tears. Would these images have worked well with Supreme? I don't think so. We move. The clothing went through usual channels for collaborations. Samples were produced and then silence. After a junior level black employee complained to Mr. Jebby about the imagery, saying it belonged in the museum, not a skate shop, the collaboration was effectively shelved. No one spoke to Miss Emery about the collaboration's fate. This is what he doesn't speak about. Even though he says Supreme was a systemically black corporation that held him down. It was a black person, a junior, that basically got the collaboration shelved. Why don't we speak about that? Why don't we speak about the black people that don't like the stuff that you do, as opposed to it just being like a race, a white thing? Like, come on, bro. During a meeting discussing the work of the black artist, Lauren Halsey, Mr. Emery said he didn't want to discuss working with black artists until getting clarity about the Jaffa collaboration. Soon after, he received a call from Human Resources, he said, saying they received a complaint that the meeting had been emotional and racially charged. <laughs> the guy's getting written up. Only 13 months of the job, he's getting written up already. God almighty. After his resignation, Mr. Emery said and Mr. Jebbia had a frank, vulnerable four-hour conversation at Mr. Emery's home. Mr. Emery said that Mr. Jebbia said that the reason he never talked about him, the Jaffa collaboration, was because he knew he he would change his mind. At one point, Mr. Emery said Mr. Jebbia had tears in his eyes. <laughs> this sounds like when Brendan said, um, "What's his name?" Casey Affleck came up to him with tears in his eyes. It's time to quit fighting. All right, I always suspect him because he did things wrong, in my opinion. But he looked me in my eyes and talked to me like a grown man. He apologized to my face and he's the only person in the company that did that. Okay. So why are you still talking about it then? Come on, bro. He's the most important person in the company. Why are you still crying about this? Then? If, the, if the guy that founded it, that's still leading it, came to your house and spoke to you face to face like a man about the whole shit outside of everything that happened, why are you still crying? After the business of fashion publishing account of Mr. Emery's exit framed in a way he found disingenuous, I texted James just a picture of the White Fragility book. I said, I hope one day you read this book. Imagine texting, oh my God, bro, this guy is a fucking idiot. White Fragility. Book written by a white woman about racism. Text it to... Okay, cool. Um, I hope one day you read this book so you can really understand where I'm coming from. I don't know if if me and you will ever speak again, but regardless if we do, I hope you read this book. Mr. Connell, who'd worked for Supreme as well, quit after the article's release. Oh, so she quit, so she doesn't work there anymore. Okay, I thought she still worked at Supreme. Cool. Fair play. Okay, that I respect. Fair play to her for quitting. Stand by your man. Um, in that same conversation, Mr. Emery said Mr. Jebbia expressed hope that Emery would reconsider returning to the position, but Mr. Emery would declined. People in people interface, so they wanted. So after everything that happened, they still wanted him to come back, and he's still crying about structural racism. After everything that occurred, errors and missteps and mistakes on both sides, they still wanted to come back, and he's still crying. People in interfacing with Tremaine 
Treat him with love and excitement and exuberance, says Miss, says Miss McConnell. And I think that maybe he's learned, which could also probably be a little bit heartbreaking, that sometimes there's things under that he needs to pay attention to. No, he needs to learn that working in corporation, this is what happens. When you have to work with other people that aren't just your own team, you're going to butt heads with people because they just they have different priorities than you. They see the world differently than you do. Doesn't mean they're fucking bad people. It just means they see the world differently. It's perfectly okay. Miss Emery concurred. You're hiring a guy that does Black Jesus with a cotton reef on his head as creative director. I felt like you're a real one. And that you have to go down like this. It makes you feel like I was wrong. No. They hired you because of that. But what if you expected to do a Black Jesus with a cotton reef on the head at Supreme, you're an idiot. Surely your ideas are more than this. They're like, hey, you're doing interesting things there. Maybe you could take some of that DNA, some of that fucking juice, and apply it to what we're doing. But it doesn't mean like for like. Come on, bro. That's easy to fucking understand. Ask whether he'd consider taking a creative director role, another white-owned company. Miss Emery wrestled with the question with both micro and macro form. He should just say no outright, right? But of course, money, innit? Let's see his answer. If people didn't value Virgil being at Louis more than off-white, maybe he wouldn't have taken the job. Huh? Oh, my head is hurting. My head is fucking hurting. My head is literally hurting now. So he's trying to say in a roundabout way that people only valued Virgil's contribution to fashion because he took the, ver the job at... Oh. Okay, 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 okay. Hubris is a hell of a drug. I can be honest and say I work steadfastly on my own validation index and focus on only finding validation from seeing a kid of any color wearing the denim tears in the streets. But I don't know. I don't want to cap you down, man. I don't know. Surely after everything you've been through, you would just say no to ever taking a job as a CD of another white-owned company when you have all these complicated racially charged complex you're very passionate clearly about this sort of shit surely you would just say lie in the sand never again am i working for another white owned company unless i'm working as in partnership but i'm not going to work underneath them as a fucking office person but now nah, let's just keep the door open because i want that like what like what what, what what do you stand on like where is this what's this going shaky shaky anyways continue um I wonder if he wore that blue one as an ode to the Virgil shot. Remember the Virgil shot in New York Times where he's wearing the white, the, the baby blue um, off-white hoodie? I wonder if he's wearing the same thing or that. Um, for now, the freedom of denim tears is what soothes and, sa and sates um, Mr. Amory, whether it's his ability to release a Jaffa collaboration with no pushback. Are we supposed to hide these scars and never look at these scars again? Oh, he's just not going to stop with the slavery shit. You know, a comic collection themed around black jockeys whose hidden history Miss Emery's father taught him about. Some people don't give me grace that maybe I'm thinking hard, he said, more resigned and frustrated and angry. Some people don't give me grace that I'm maybe thinking too, like, what, you're just too smart for us. Is that what you're trying to say? All right. Ultimately, Mr. Emery and his critics agree that no version of the black experience is universal. My view is I can't tell another black person how to feel about their black experience because black people aren't a monolith. You make it seem like they are, though, innit? <laughs> okay. Says one thing, does the other. He said acknowledging that the, uh, the uncontrollable discourse is in many ways key to his creative project. They have the right to unfollow me. They have the right to leave the comment. They have a right to not buy it, tell other people not to buy it. But what they can't do is change what I'm going to do. Okay, fair play. That's probably the best bit of the whole thing. That's probably the best paragraph of the whole fucking article. Fair play. If that's the way he wants to speak about it. If he's going to, he's basically saying, I'm going to keep talking about race and clothing and whatever and whatever issues on my, with stuff that I make until the end of time. You're free to complain and cry about it, but you're not going to change what I'm going to do. Fair. Fair enough. I just hate you because I think he can offer way more. But if this is what his brand is going to be, this is what he's going to reduce it to. Fair play. Fair play. So big up Tremaine in that regard. Um, exhaustive, painful article. But in the end, you got some decent headshots in there. You got to talk his talk, share his story. And again, complain for the umpteenth time about fucking Supreme. He can't seem to let it go. It seemed to be a horrible time in his life. It came about the worst time in his life. He got the job, I think, what, when Virgil died. 
Um, it also was the same time he got fucking ill. And you'd imagine you want to fucking t- not talk about it, just leave it alone. But he can't help not talk about it. So I guess it is what it's it going to be. Anytime, anytime you hear Tremaine, you're going to hear Supreme. Anytime you hear Supreme, you're going to hear people complain about Tremaine. I guess it is what it is. I guess it is what it blood clot is. What can we do? What can we bloody do? Absolutely nothing. Okay, moving on from that one. Moving, flipping on from that easy to move on thing here. Let's also move on to this. So, um, this guy, Matthew Welty, has always had some very horrible takes when it comes to sneakers um he's a host of the sneaker podcast on complex i'm not too sure if he's still around anymore i'm not gonna lie but i always see him giving these the worst hot takes when it's relating to fucking sneakers i've ever seen and i just don't understand why he just doesn't shut the fuck up so his latest hot take he has here is sneakers aren't dead or boring you're just not excited about them at 32 as you were when you were 22 because your life has changed and that's okay no that's not true. Sneakers are inherently way more boring nowadays than they've ever been. That's it. They're not as good as they were as they were in the past. Collaborations are shit. The way they release them are super annoying. Sneakers are a multi-million dollar fucking industry, but they still try to make you believe that there's a limited amount that they can make. So artificial scarcity to drive fucking demand and have fucking kids lining up outside of stores and stabbing and fighting each other and then putting that putting that all that on the fucking news and then using all that pandemonium and fucking hurt and pain as a marketing rollout for more shoes it's fucking annoying at this point i've always been on the belief i don't think limited edition sneakers exist anymore with sneak industry being a multi-billion dollar industry there is no need for sneakers to be exclusive every everyone and their dog knows what a fucking easy is knows what a fragment shoe is knows what a travis scott collaboration is knows what a jordan is knows what a dunk is there is no mystery there is a limit edition. It doesn't exist. And if you can't get it legit, you just go and get it from Red Factories anyway. So the idea that things have to be artificially scarce is fucking annoying. I hate it with a passion. And I think these type of takes are dumb also because if you're still actively into sneakers the same way when you were 30, 22, when you're 30, 22 when you're 32, you're a bit of a redact too. You should maybe temper off of things. But in general, overall, Overall, it's without a doubt clear that sneakers aren't as good as they once were. The sneakers just aren't. It's, it is a bit dead. It is a bit boring. The same type of new balances come out. The same type of ASICs are coming out now. That even ASICs are getting into repeating, you know, silhouettes and, st- and kind of vibes and aesthetics and all that going forward. ADS is kind of getting boring now that Yeezy isn't around anymore. Not really interesting things going on. Maybe the most interesting company out there that's actually making interesting shoes might be Crocs, you know? For better or worse, Crocs might be the most interesting footwear brand out there with their range of collaborations, with the experimentation they're doing, the different silhouettes, the risks they're taking. But again, are we really going to be sitting here talking seriously about Crocs? Of course not. Well, that's not the only shitty Matthew Welty take he had. The other one that I thought was maybe the pinnacle of shittiness that I forgot to mention on this fucking podcast was this fucking take he had a while back where he said, for better or worse, the Panda Dunk is the most influential sneaker of the past five years. I can't imagine any other shoe to get more new people into sneakers than that one. What a horrible take. What a horrible shitty take. How could you confuse a shoe being popular with it being influential? Especially when it's a retro of a shoe that's already popular before that fucking iteration came out. Dunks have always been well regarded. There was a renaissance uh, regen of people liking dunks within the last five years or so, but the Panda Dunk was one of the last colorways to come out in and amongst that kind of rebirth of dunks. So how is the Panda Dunk specifically influential? Maybe the silhouette. Maybe you could say the Dunk silhouette is the most influential shape, is the most influential model, sneaker model of the past five years. Even then, I still wouldn't agree, but that might have made more sense than saying the Pacific Panda Dunk, the one that every normie girl around the world wears, is no, it's not. It's just popular. Same way that 
all those girls were, before were wearing skate, you know, uh, skate highs, new schools, Converse, seven E's. Those girls were wearing Harajis at one point. Those girls were wearing white Air Force Ones at one point. That you you don't say because all these normie girls with scrunchies and fucking what do you call it and um what are they called and Stanleys because they went Air Force Ones that like, now nah, Air Force Ones are the most influential. Single. It's like what what type of shit you taking? And it and it's a funny thing. He's meant to be an authority. This guy's got like a sneaker podcast. It's very popular. People like listen to him when it comes to like sneakers opinions and shit. And this guy just talks absolute shit. And it's almost dizzying, but not surprising. Because fundamentally, the sneaker industry is full of people that don't know what they're talking about. Generally don't know what they're talking about. I, I don't know why that is, personally. I can't really figure it out. Maybe it's because all the good people get absorbed into companies and they're too busy working and doing, you know, actual things as opposed to just, uh, you know, sharing their um, unsolicited, unnecessary opinions on social media. I don't really know. But it's quite astounding that this guy happens to be a very important, very pivotal, very influential figure in sneakers and has the worst takes in the world. Like, how is a panda dunk of, of like, what? What are you talking about? Like, honestly, what are you talking about? I don't know. He doesn't know. Absolute bullshit. Two opinions back to back. Absolute garbage. And yeah, it's it's no, it's no surprise that Complex is going to go under soon. And it's no surprise that that sneaker podcast, everybody fucking hates it. And it'll probably go under the wayside as well. It is what it is. It is what it blood club is. Moving on, we're going to talk about this also regarding um, Nike and Bape settling their trademark lawsuit for the copycat or lookalike sneaker shit. Obviously, you guys know it as the Bapester issue. So let me get this up on here for you to, to check out. So big up the fashion law. Nike and Bape settled trademark lawsuit over lookalike sneakers. Um, Nike and Bape have settled the, law, the trademark lawsuit over the latter's escalating infringement of some of Nike's most well-known sneaker designs. In a filing lodged in the U.S. District Court of the Southern District of New York on Monday, counsel for Nike and Bape jointly st stipulated to dismissal of the, of the case with prejudice, including all claims and defenses, and agreed to each pay their own cost, attorney fees, the companies alerted the court that they have entered into a settlement agreement in resolution of the case and representation of the Nike saying the settlement saying the statement that the, the furtherance of the settlement, Bape agreed to discontinue its sale of some of the allegedly infringed sneakers. Rotted. The settlement comes on the heels of Bape's unsnificantly seeking to early escape the trademark infringement and dilution claims that Nike first waged against it in January 2023. In May 2023, a motion to dismiss Bape argued that Nike failed to adequately identify the elements of sneaker trade dresses that are the case. However, SDNY judge Paul um, refused to grant the Nigo founded brand's motion last month, holding that the certificates um, for registration that Nike incorporates in a complaint adequately articulate the scope of Nike's asserted trades and the registr and registrations contain detailed written descriptions as well as diagrams that specifically denote which parts of the trade dress are being claimed as distinctive. Now, this is an interesting thing because I have always felt, and I think most people that also collect sneakers will feel the same thing, when the Bapesters originally came out, I think it might have been like early 2000s, right when they originally launched. The funny thing about them was that when they launched and why they were so successful was that back then Nike weren't doing the great colorways that Bape were doing on Bapesters. So ba the Bapesters originally were basically a copy of the Nike Air Force Low, as you can see here on this top row, right? So the top row, you've got the classic Nike Air Force One Low. And you've got the Bapes iteration, which is basically the same silhouette. Instead of the Nike swoosh, you've got the star logo there, right? Now, when Bape first introduced this shape onto the market, the reason why it was so widely received was because Nike weren't doing those crazy colorways that Bape were doing on Bapesters. They're just doing the traditional retros that they did, kind of boring, but they weren't really challenging or pushing themselves with colorways when it comes to Air Force Ones. The only times you saw them really going crazy with the Air Force One low colorways was when they did collaborations with um, Clot when they were still under Nike and when they did stuff with Easter. Some of the Easter shoes that they put out or maybe something, I can't think, maybe Undefeat shoot also. But for the most part, Clot and their Easter Air Force Ones were the only times they went crazy on the Air Force One. Most of them were just muted colorways. So Babe came in and did these really crazy, bold, expressive colorways on the same silhouette. And the thing that made it even more harder for Nike to compete with was that the Bape silhouette, the Bape shape of the copy of the Air Force One, actually improved on it 
And if, and if anything, if you're a real OG, if you're a real sneakhead, if you know the knowledge, you'll know that the Babester, the actual shape of it was more akin to the original Air Force One that was, that was released in the 80s as opposed to the retro. The retro of the Air Force One is good, but it's not as good as it could be because some of the OG Air Force Ones, the shape on them, as you can see even from this Babester here, that I think this is a jammed collaboration, was so... like. It, to either describe it, but Nike retros were known to have a little banana thing at the front. I think they used to say it's because of the last that they use in a factory or whatever. It was shit. So people didn't like some of the retros that Nike used to do because they used to just kind of bend up at the front. Babe, when they redid the Air Force One, they had this almost like flat silhouette, this kind of flat profile that made it look way more aggressive, made it look way more sleek, made the toes stick to the ground a bit more. And you had this really aggressive kind of pointy shoe. Um, pointy triangle type of shape on the front but then the other thing that was really interesting about it Air Force Ones if you've ever worn them are known to be incredibly heavy Babe were able to improve on the shape of the retros by hearkening the shape back to the OGs and they also made the shoe lighter even though it was a chunky shoe so you got the silhouette you got the shape of the shoe that could be worn amazingly with baggy jeans all that shit but it was also lighter than the traditional Air Force One that's why they're successful and obviously better colorways so there are these amazing Marvel collaboration colorways, all these bright, expressive colors of the Bapesters that Nigo wore, that Little Wayne wore, all these cool things that Nike weren't doing. So they basically saw a gap in the market and capitalized on it. And, and I think there was a time I remember hearing that allegedly when Nigo redesigned the Bapester and tried to reimagine it as Air Force One, he allegedly changed, I think, over a thousand, no, even like a hundred things. There's a hundred different points of different. There's a hundred points of difference on the Babester to differentiate it from the Air Force One. Like little things like on the paneling, on the height of the midsole, all this sort of stuff, how the outsole looks, it's all kind of different. And I guess they thought that was enough, but obviously it definitely wasn't because the shape of it lends too much to what they're already doing. But that's the unfortunate thing that, it didn't really, instead of challenging Nike to just put out better quality shoes and nicer colorways, it didn't. It just stopped, you know, stopped them doing it. Hey, stop doing that instead of actually going back to the drawing board and trying to challenge them. Because if they, if Nike would have come back out and decided to, because I still think to this day, Nike should basically put out an Air Force One that is premium, like a premium level Air Force One that harkens back to the original Air Force One shape and put that out there and let people buy that for maybe an increased price or whatnot but have it be done in the best materials and the best colorways in the best possible shape. So basically like what they're doing with the Jordan um, 4 reimagines, right? Where you're basically going back and taking that original shape and putting it onto, you know, and basically re retroing that original shape silhouette instead of the, the recent retros we had. That would actually do pretty well. But, you know, they don't, they slam countries down and kind of end it. In some regards, because Babe is no longer owned by Nigo, might be for the best because, you know, some of these babes you see coming out nowadays, some of the babe clothing nowadays is utterly garbage and it breaks your heart how horrible that brand is now that Nigo stepped away. But interesting case and good to see that they settled it. But it's funny now that they said, um, what you call it, babe uh, have agreed to not sell it and right? to discontinue to sell the shoes. Yes, it says it right there. Babe agreed to discontinue itself some of its allegedly infringing sneakers and to redesign others. So some of them aren't going to be out anymore. Uh, maybe some of the bait ones might be the Air Force One mid. Maybe that skate star might be a bit too bait. But yeah, maybe the Jordan 2. But good to see that they're changing it. Good to see that they're changing it. Good to see that they're changing it. Okay, cool. Um, we've got a couple more here to go before I have the jet. So let's actually run through these ones here before I have to obviously decide to go. So, next one to talk about, Jamie XX. Jamie XX collaborates with London Venue MOT on a 10-night residency, The Floor. Big up with Venue MOT. We don't, have a, we don't have many great venues in London. I keep complaining and crying about it. Obviously, on this pod, most of you would know that. I don't stop talking about these type, type of things. But Venue MOT in South London definitely is one of our better venues. Um, it definitely is. I wouldn't say it's on par with Fold, but it's, 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 around, it's around there. Do you know what I mean? Um, there's not many great ones apart from Fold, obviously, in London. But definitely Venue MOT do a good job of what they're doing. So they've got this night called The Floor that they're doing in collaboration with Jamie XX, um, who I'm obviously a big fan of. Um, as you can see here, I met Jamie XX a long, long time ago outside the yard, um, theatre, where I was off my fucking face on whatever I was on. And he was very, 
very nice. Didn't have to be because I was blabbering. I was giving him loads of praise. I, I might have got down on my knees and sucked him off at one point because I love him so much, his productions. But what a legend, what a great guy. Let's go back to the fucking article. The UK artist will be joined by a different TBA artist and guest from May 16th to the 25th. Let's read it, courtesy of the RA. Um, Jay Maxis is playing 10 Conservative Nights at London's menu, MOT in May. Running from the 16th through the 25th, the residency dubbed The Floor will see the UK artist and TBS guest performing in a bespoke 300 capacity space within the club the other artists won't be revealed until the night of each event i love that i love that that's a great way to promote your fucking to promote your thing. i'm not gonna lie i fucking love that for years i've been dreaming about opening my own club yeah me too bro honestly rogan's the one that has put the bat in my back since i've seen rogan open his own comedy club in austin and basically book himself to play <laughs> every single day, right? Every week, Rogan fucking performs at now rated as one of the best comedy clubs in America because he's fucking his club. And he's thinking, you know what? I need my own... I, that's what I'm going to do. Fuck buying a Lambo like some of these guys do when they get their content... When their content checks drops, they buy a Lambo or McLaren. I'm opening up my own club, mate. Fuck that shit. I'm opening up my own club. And I'm booking myself to play back-to-back -back weekends. <laughs> Even when the crowd boos, I'll just keep booking myself. Fuck it. Um, he says here, uh, For years, I've been dreaming of opening my own club in London, a place that represents my experiences in the best of London's underground club scene, the intimacy, the community, the creation, the sound. This month, I get to, get, I get to make that dream a reality. Ooh. So is this, like a, is this like an introduction to Jamie's club that might be coming up? Is he taking over the venue MOT? Hmm. Huh. Interesting that he'd say that. The residency follows Jamie XX's recent single, Baddie on the Floor, which is a banger, by the way. Check it out. Featuring with Honey Dejon. Long with his single, uh, second album is also nearly finished. For more about the floor, including how to apply for tickets via Jamie XX's website. There goes the floor. Great fly as well, by the way. Um, I'm obviously eagerly looking forward to it. Um, on the subject of residencies, we need more of these, man. We need more residencies. There was a time after COVID during the whole playground thing where all these promoters and clubs were pretending like they went to do residencies again. They wanted to book local talent. <laughs> and the moment the world went back to normal, every club and promoter just started booking all the bait DJs. There was no trying to like uplift different voices and platform different people. And, you know, you know, um, what you call it? Give the consumer something different. Nah, all that stuff went away. But I honestly do think like, although... I feel like the love affair with Bergheim and Berlin is a little bit OTT and annoying because that city is just a bit of an anomaly in terms of like nightlife and clubbing and shit. I feel like one of the things that we should copy about those type of places is the dependency and the relying on like residents. They do that a lot more than what we do in London because they have a lot more local guys and girls you know, maybe some of them aren't even Berliners or whatever, just, you know, people that just live, no, not you know, natively German or whatever, but people that live there who basically play at clubs, you know, Monday to Friday, most fucking weeks, and then the big guests come on the weekend, or sometimes they fill up most of the lineup with the local talent and then have the guest superstar DJs come in, which gives the local talent a chance to play in front of a hapt uh, captive audience, gets a chance for them to play alongside, quote unquote, a big name, and it gets the fans and the punters, myself included, a chance to see interesting new fresh people play. That's what you should be doing, but they don't. So we have this weird system in London where most club nights are centered around two or you know two or more headliners and then the rest of the people on the bill you don't really give a fuck for um and 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 unless it's a place like fold where i think people kind of go half of the club and half of the lineups that's what, that might be the exception most other places people are only going there for whoever's playing and that's obviously not good you want the clubs to be full most weeks and the only way to do it in my personal opinion is what we've seen so far is the evidence is out there i'm not some scholar or some expert here i'm just going by what i see and what works out there it's clearly the residence way where you have somebody playing you have a group of people a roster of resident djs who play let's say tuesday to fucking you know thursday whatever in the club all the time and obviously on the Fridays they fill up most of the lineups but then you have your headliner coming and you get them to fill up the venue and then what you happens is that you get a chance to quote unquote educate the punters to know what to expect most weeks okay you're going to get this type of vibe this type of person and it builds up and it goes on from there because you know 
there's not many success stories, unfortunately, nowadays in London of people starting up playing in one club as a resident DJ and then becoming a global star, which as they should be, because everybody's obsessed with fucking headliners and it's fucking annoying. But regardless, um, big up Jamie XX. Can't wait for this event to happen um, over there at Venue MOT. I'm definitely going to be there. Venue MOT again, one of our better venues here in London, although it's in the depths of South. Venue MOT, Venue MOT might be one of the only venues, maybe that in the carpet shop and maybe like, you know, what's it called? Um, what's that fucking place called? Uh, Planet Wax, is that called, right? Are the only places where I legitimately would leave my humble abode to travel down to South to go and check out. So if you haven't been Venue MOT, I definitely recommend you check it out. One of our better venues here in London. And obviously, Jamie XX is going to be playing there very, very soon. So big up, Jamie Blood Clark XX. Cool. Let's continue here. Let's got this news, courtesy of, you know, Berlin news. Let's, let's, let's do some Berlin news here. This is rather interesting. I'm not going to lie. Rather, rather interesting. I didn't know this was even a thing, but, you know, it is a thing now. This is courtesy of RA. Look at this one. A long time coming. Berlin clubs welcome hard-fought cannabis legalization in Germany. As of April 1st, laws around the drug have relaxed nationwide, meaning people can now carry up to 25 grams for personal consumption. That's pretty cool, isn't it? 25 grams of weed, of loud you can have on your possession and you're not going to get nabbed by the, you know, fucking handsy, aggressive Berlin police over there or German police. Pretty cool. Germany's um, partial organization of cannabis has been welcomed by clubs in Berlin, though some say little will change on the dance floor. The new law came into effect on April 1st, meaning people can now carry up to 25 grams of personal consumption, grow up to free plants at home and smoke in designated areas of the club. That's pretty cool, right? Don't get me wrong, because as much as I love to get on it with the uppers in clubs, I think having a joint in a techno club, having a joint in a house club, whatever, in Berlin is actually a good. It's actually a good experience because the clubs are open during the day, longer hours. You get a chance to kind of you know mellow in and vibe out with the fucking environment. And sometimes when you want to come down and kind of get yourself recalibrated to go and sleep, what better way instead of running home straight away? You get a chance to kind of like deregulate you know, a little bit yourself, take yourself down a couple of notches by having a fat zoot outside of the venue or inside the venue, sitting down, watching all the fucking people frolic around. Not a bad thing. I'm not going to lie. Um, from July 1st, the so-called cannabis clubs can supply up to 500 members with a maximum monthly allowance of 50 Gs. Two years ago, April 20th, hundreds of people gathered outside Berlin's Brandenburg Gate to protest in favor of legalization. This is why the new law has come as a relief for many of the city's venues and party people. Again, another example of why people should never compare Berlin to any other city in Europe, maybe the world. Their, you know, relationship with nightlife, their relationship with drugs and all this malarkey is so different to any other place. Um, legalization in the UK will never happen. Never. We are so anti-fun. Like, we ban everything. We ban fucking balloons, scooters, all sorts of shit. We just don't like fun. So I don't ever see a situation where cannabis will ever be legal, even partially. Never. Never, ever. Even decriminalized. I don't think it'll ever happen in the UK. Ever happen. Um, Erica Seek, how do you say that? Erica Sykesteliot. Erica Sykesteliot, Sykesteliot, co-founder of wedding club Panic, or uh, Panka, sorry, Panke, Panka, Panke is one of them. You're welcome to sit on our outdoor patio and enjoy a joint with a coffee or a glass of wine. Ooh, guess where I'm going then? Big up Panke. Um, you're welcome to sit on the outdoor patio and enjoy a joint um, with a coffee or a glass of wine. The fight for legalized cannabis in Germany has been ongoing for decades, so this legalization is encouraging and we hope will become an example for other European countries where cannabis laws are very, very strict. For other venues like Renate, legalization feeds into a wider harm reduction narrative. Speaking to RA, spokesperson Zoe Eluneta, El Elunet, Eulentel, Eulentel, Zoe Eulentel said, legalization marks a sufficient change for Berlin's nightlife, representing a shift towards more progressive drug policies and aligning with a safer nightlife approach. Visitors at Renate, she added, can smoke cannabis in the garden at its open-air sister venue, Else, which reopens next weekend. Oh, wow, Else is opening. Sick. Else is one of the sickest outdoor venues in Berlin. Outdoor open-air places to go to. I can't imagine how fucking sick that'll be. 
to be in the fucking sun, smoking a fucking doobie, flicking your fingers up and down in the air and shit. Oh, that's going to be fun. Um, launch party featuring David Bunk and Tom Trago. That's going to be a blast, by the way. Um, what else have they got coming in? Um, they've got been playing D- DJ Hell. Oh, fuck Jane Fitz. Boo to her. But Nicholas Lutz is there as well. And Omar, love to see that. Permanent, oh, the permanent vacation. Perel, Cornell, Kovacs, Alinica on the 5th of May. This is a really good lineup, bro. Oh, look at that one. We got C Tomac. Oh, Phil Berg. Oh, that's going to be a good one, isn't it? Right? God damn. Melt pre party here happening. You got a Keddy showcase between Fidel, Stanislav, Koska Chelev. Another one, you got Sesh with DJ Gagola, Estella Borisma, DJ Hyperdrive, Aisha. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Again, I'm not the biggest fan of going to Berlin when it's hot and sunny. I find it a really sticky place to be. But open air parties are some of the best there. They got some of the best open air parties, honestly. Um, really fucking fun. You got another one, you got Todd Church Night happening. That's pretty cool as well there. I'm a big fan of that one. You've got Teenage Dreams, DJ Heartstrings, Crush, Shimmy Robin. Oh, that is that is going to be hype as well, but you can see already there. 847 people interested in that one. That's going to be a barnstormer. Oh, I might, I might have to go on that weekend. I'm not going to lie. This is this might have to be the one I might have to be interested in. I might have to make that a fucking mission. Teenage Heartstrings. Are you Teenage Dreams? Sorry, and DJ Heartstrings. That, that should be a good one. Uh, I'm re- oh, okay. I've already got it interested. Whoops. I thought I wasn't interested already, but I am already interested. Uh-oh. Tickets already sold out on that one as well, by the way. Bumbarated, DJ Heartstring, Crush 3D, DJ Visa, LC, Shimmy Robin, and Al Fandy playing. That should be a good one. And let's go back again, see some other fucking dates they got here. Big up else. Can't wait to go check that out, mate. Collective are playing there. You got BCCO Night and a few others as well happening. So, yeah. Um, else is back out there so clearly summer's arriving let's go back to the fucking article um so you can smoke so they like you smoke at renate no you can't smoke at renate only at else but another berlin-based promoter who didn't want to named was quick to point out that people have been smoking cannabis in cities club for years it's true but now it's legal you know what i mean because being a black man of a certain description of a certain type, going up to a club, you know, and trying to smoke a joint, sometimes you get dirty looks. Sometimes security asks you questions and shit. I've had joints confiscated off me when I've been to certain venues. So I'm not happy that you can just, you know, you can do it without having to hide your shit in your sock, under your sweaty balls, you know, try and disguise it with fucking cigarettes. That's good. You can just have it behind your ear like a fucking cigarette and no one's going to care. I love that. That's fucking amazing. So great to hear, great to see that. And also, most parks had people smoking there, but you don't. I don't. Not, I don't want to be smoking in secret, you know, behind a tree with some African uncle. I'd rather be doing it somewhere cool and fun. You know what I mean? But hey, maybe that's just me. Um, people are pointing that people have been smoking cannabis city clubs for years. It doesn't really make a difference for Berliners, ravers. It's nice that we can now spark um, out outside of an airport. Um, he's oh yeah that's very true um, he said Berliners have been sharing memes that joke that how Berlin looked exactly the same before and after legalization every underground electronic music venue I know allowed consumption of weed and didn't say anything as long as it was a reasonable amount and most of the police turned up uh, yeah but you still got dirty looks I know people gave me dirty looks and again I've had joints confiscated from me from clubs so you know a- anecdotal I know but at least that's my experience the other side of the story he added is that legalization, while useful in some places like Bavaria, where they can fuck you up for the first one joint, is also a ploy to win votes. The German government is the most fascist leadership we've had in 26 years. They're trying to be sexy to young people with this legalization, but for Berlin, nothing changes. Yeah, but Germany doesn't revolve around Berlin, does it? Come on, bro. Like, fucking hell. Berliners sometimes are, they're, they're fucking insufferable, isn't it? They think the whole of Germany revolves around them. It's like, bro, it's good for everybody. Why aren't you happy about this shit? Like, come on, bro. Yeah, get you guys a f- forward thinking and you've been okay with it for ages and it's been accepted, blah, blah, blah. But it's a good thing that you can now spark up a joint in fucking what? In Dusseldorf, in Frankfurt, in Cologne, in all these places. That's in Munich. It's a good thing, you know? Come on, bro. Shit. Open up the whole country for everyone. We probably put some less pressure on going out to places like Berlin in the purpose anyway. What do I know? 
Earlier this week, the Berlin Club Commission published guidelines around the cannabis and clubbing and advising people to consume responsibly and to understand that each venue will have its own policy. Spokesperson Lutz Leitschringer, who's told RA that he thinks the organization will attract more tourists to Berlin. So that's what they do. That's, that's basically what they don't want, isn't it? Berliners don't want tourism, but tourism kind of keeps the lights on over there. You'd think. I, I think so anyway. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think so. Let's continue. It's been a long time coming, but this will finally help decriminalize people who've been smoking cannabis in Germany for decades, aka black people. I think it's part of our reality that people smoke weed legalization is the right decision. It's very late arriving, but now we have it. Again, it's still complete. Berliners or German Germans can complain in it. You've got le you've got partial legalization, and you niggas are still complaining. I would love that to happen in the UK. It's never happening. Could you ever see a reality where a Tory government a Labour government, any government, right? Any government would ever, ever, ever con contemplate having, you know, legalizing cannabis. Ever. It wouldn't happen. It wouldn't fucking happen. So the fact these guys are still complaining makes me fucking laugh, really. Um, but yeah, that's it. So J Berlin's reopening now. Um, you can smoke weed everywhere, which I think is a good experience. I think I might actually go try that, especially when I go at the end of May and see what I go on. Great to hear. Great fucking news. Love it. Especially for my black brothers and sisters out there who get fucking demonized and get looked upon like you're a fucking psycho for smoking a drink in the club. But sometimes I feel like, you know, with everybody being on uppers and everybody spurging out, actually smoking a joint in a club might be the most chicest thing ever. Being able to be in that kind of zone and chill and vibey. That might actually be the pl great place to be. So I'm all for it. I'm all fucking for it. I think that's great news. I love to see it. I love to fucking see it. Okay, my friends, that has been it. That has been the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. That has been episode number 772. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's a pleasure to have your company. If you're listening to the podcast via the audio side of the pod, please make sure you leave me a five-star review on all of the special platforms where I put my podcast, Apple, Spotify, anywhere else you listen to it. Leave me a five-star review. Let people know that you like the show. That'd be greatly appreciated. All links regarding what I'm talking about can be found in the description after the fact. Links to myself can also be found in the description. And of course, if you want to reach out, you can reach me at theaccionalzingashow.com. The contact button's at the top. Click on there. It'll get to me and I'll reply back to you as soon as possible. Anyway, before we leave, I want to play for you my tune of the day. My tune of the day is the one and only Tommy Richmond, who's been unfairly labelled as a fucking industry plant, even though he's been grinding for fucking years, which is annoying. There's no such thing as overnight success. This kid's been going at it for a while, and this fucking song, Million Dollar Baby, has been banging. I've been having this on repeat since it dropped. So this is Million Dollar Baby, courtesy of Tommy Richmond, as my tune of the day. Thank you for tuning in. Agassino Zinger Show out. Peace. <laughs>